Low protein or low carb? Low carb. Cardio or weights? Both. Caffeine extends lifespan, improves health span, and delays age-associated pathology. In the primary care system, oftentimes the primary care system is so corporatized these days that they, you know, you spend 10 minutes with your doctor, you go down your checklist and you're done, and they have to get on to the next patient. Yeah, I mean, I think the same thing's true with a lot of the vitamins, right? The normal range is really suboptimal for many people. I think that's an unfortunate aspect of the current healthcare. My name is Matt Kibberly, and welcome to the OptiSpan YouTube channel. Hey everyone, welcome to the OptiSpan podcast. And on today's episode, I'm joined by Dr. George Sutphin from the University of Arizona, and we're going to talk about unraveling the aging process. So uh, George uh, got his bachelor's and master's degrees in aeronautics and astronautics, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then did his PhD in the molecular and cellular biology program at the University of Washington, um, then went on to do a postdoc at the Jackson Laboratories. And then in 2018, uh, took a faculty position at the University of Arizona in the cellular and molecular biology department? Uh, molecular and cellular <laughs> okay. biology department. And then in 2018, took a faculty position at the University of Arizona in the molecular and cellular biology department. Um, George is a fellow of the American Aging Association and the current chair of the American Aging Association. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So George, welcome to the podcast. It's uh, fantastic to have you down at OptiSpan headquarters today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I've been uh, wanting to get down and check out your uh, your new digs. Here, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so let's start. Um, you know, at the beginning, how did you get interested in aging as an area of research that you wanted to study? Uh, yes. So I've I've always had kind of an interest in the background. My dad, who is not a scientist, he was a bus driver, uh, but he was always kind of interested as a layperson in the bio in in aging and uh, yeah, lifespan extension. Uh, and I remember he would uh, talk about various supplements. I think he was uh, taking growth hormone for a while really? back in the 90s when wow. that was the, the a big thing. Um, but And so he always, uh, growing up, he always said, oh, you should definitely go into genetics. That's where the, the future is, right? And, huh. and to do this sort of thing. Um, and of course, uh, I then went into engineering and decided to, to be a rocket scientist and uh, go build a spacecraft. So that was where I started. Which uh, is a, I mean, that's an atypical background, right? For somebody who, who works on the biology of aging to switch from aeronautics and astronautics or engineering to aging, right? Yes, uh, though I, I would say it's becoming more common these days. I think in, in our department, probably the last three or four hires have all had some sort of quantitative background and then switched into biology. But yes, it, from a <laughs> traditional perspective, it is uh, n not as common for sure. So what made you make that transition? Yeah, uh, so I, I went through my Bachelor of Science. I was in, in a PhD program, and uh, at least in engineering uh, at the University of Washington, uh, the, the typical course was to get a master's and then a PhD. So I was kind of around the time I was getting my master's. And um, and this was what, like 2006, 2005? Uh, yeah, probably about 2005, around where I started. Uh, I think I'd seen some sort of a, a public facing article on on aging research. And I, I'd always kind of had it in the back of my head because of these conversations with my father when I was younger. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I, I at that point, I didn't think it was um, kind of real science. There's a lot, you know, the there's a lot of this public facing uh, stuff that's uh, not not good science. Still today. <laughs> yes, still today. Um, and I just kind of assumed that that's what was out there. And that's but I started reading about it. Um, came across a few papers, and uh, it it started to sound like maybe there was something to it, and there was real science there. And I I got to the point um, where I was I realized I was kind of spending more time reading about this biology and this aging science than I was about my uh, rock, mm. my work in yeah. uh, in engineering. And at some point, a light bulb went off, and it's like, well, maybe maybe this is what I want to do. And uh, so I started. Uh, I came down to South Campus. Um, I started talking to people. I think I started with George Martin, yeah. kind of a well-known person in the aging space, um, and just started talking to him. He sent me to Peter Rabinovich, and he sent me to Brian Kennedy, and eventually I got <laughs> to you. Yeah, yeah. So that was right, I think, about the time 
that I started my lab, right? So, I did not know that at the time. Yeah. I think you'd only been open for, like, what, three months or yeah, something? Right. Like that, yeah, right. I know you were – so So G George was one of the first people that I hired full-time in my lab when I uh, started my independent lab in 2006. Um, and, yeah, honestly, to this day, I don't actually know why I gave you a job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I showed up and I said, yeah, I'm uh, I'm looking to get out of uh, aerospace. I want to I want to quit that and come yeah. work in biology. I don't have any biology experience. But at that time, my own my most recent biology class was a cell biology class in high school. Yeah. So uh, my first <laughs> real biology course at the college level was in graduate school. And um, I remember I gave you a copy of uh my textbook from I think when I was an undergrad of molecular biology of the cell. Yeah. And you basically went home and read it to sort yes. of get up to speed on molecular biology. Yeah, that, that was so, my undergraduate. Yeah. Education. So that was yeah. uh that was two thousand six, yep. I think, or mid, yeah, probably two thousand six when you joined the lab, or mm -hmm. probably late two thousand six. And Something then like that, yeah. you entered the molecular and cellular biology PhD program right. probably two thousand Eight, two 2007? I think it was 2008. That okay. Yeah, so spent about a year yeah. and a half or so as a research scientist in the lab, yeah. then started your PhD uh, in 2008, and then came back to the lab for your thesis research, probably starting in, I don't know, 2009 or, or whatever. And then I looked on PubMed today. I had no idea. We have 23 co-authored papers. That's somehow. right. Yep. So that's pretty impressive for a PhD thesis. A couple of those have come out since then, but still, sure. that's a that's a, a pretty significant body of work. Yeah, um, yeah. Many of those have come out recently. Just at, you know, being an early, one of the early people in a, in any of these labs, you end up working on a lot of different projects, yeah. and you kind of everyone does a little of everything, and, right. you, and so that's there's an advantage. You get to see lots of different projects and right. end up on a lot of papers. Right. So so enough time has passed where you can you know you know you don't have to kind of shade this, and you can tell me what you think. But like, what was your favorite project? And I'm not going to ask what your least favorite project was, but what was your favorite project you worked on in the lab? Yeah, I, th there were there were a lot of things we went through. Um, I think uh, that it was kind of a side project, but the one that you you get a lot of uh, comments about and a lot of interest in is the caffeine project, yeah. which we just kind of picked up as a, on the side. I don't think I even told you I was doing that. Um, I, <laughs> I I think you started with like actual coffee extract. That's right. Or yes. Something, yeah, right? and that never really worked just <laughs> yeah. because I think the extraction process was so variable. Right. Um, Right. So uh, th that was never consistent, but we, I, I think uh, at the time, uh, I, when doing that first year, I was kind of acting as a lab manager and doing your ordering. And I think I just uh, ordered some caffeine and started putting yeah. in plates at that point. Um, and, th and then when we got a whole result, I came and talked to you. About yeah. It. And it's a little behind the scenes stuff, but I mean, that was definitely not uncommon. I would say in my lab that yeah. people would have interesting ideas and, uh, either, either wouldn't tell me about it right away or they would. And I'd be like, well, that's kind of crazy, but go see what happens. Yeah, I think that's a big advantage. <laughs> I, I've kind of taken inspiration from that in my own lab and a lot of the, our, our big projects and, uh, we do some engineering work to build new systems have come out of, uh, collaborations between the students and the engineers in the lab that come yeah. and tell me, tell me about it when they've got a good yeah. idea. So. Yeah. So we published a paper. That's one of the ones I pulled up. Caffeine extends lifespan, improves health span and delays age associated pathology in Sanorhabditis elegans. So the nematode yep. worm, um, this is, I mean, I like that paper too, because I drink a lot of coffee as well. Yep. Um, so I can use it as a justification when my wife tells me I drink too much coffee. Absolutely, um, yes. But so what this paper found, right, was that caffeine could extend lifespan in worms. And it was a pretty broad range. I mean, at some point it became toxic, right? I think above 10 millimolar or something Yeah, for like sure. That, but way higher than anybody could ever possibly achieve um, by drinking coffee, at least, in circulation. <laughs> right. And uh, there, maybe as a side note here, um, in to get drugs into worms, you need to have it at a very high concentration. So right. 10 millimolar is not going to be what you'd expect to find in your blood if you were to drink a cup of coffee. Right, it's exactly. It's way, way lower than that in humans, but there's a it, it doesn't translate directly. Yeah. But. So I don't know whether caffeine extends lifespan in people or not, but there is, there's actually pretty good epidemiological data that yeah. caffeine is uh, associated with at least lower health risks from multiple age-related diseases, yep. uh, reduced all-cause mortality. So some reason to believe there might be some conservation there. Now, I, yeah. I don't think we ever actually got to the mechanism per se. I think we no, did some genetic was. mapping. It yep. it was non-additive with caloric restriction, uh, I think. I, I'd have to, you know, it's been a while since I, <laughs> I looked at this paper. I'd have to go back and look, but that, and, that sounds right. And caffeine 
caused DAF-16 to go into the nucleus. So DAF-16 is the nematode boxo transcription factor that works in the insulin signaling pathway. So a little bit hard to tell from that. Does that mean it overlaps with caloric restriction or overlaps with insulin signaling? But I think that was sort of the farthest that we got in terms of mapping it. I think so. Yeah. Uh, the other thing from that paper that I think is noteworthy is that it seemed to be protective in the worm model of polyglutamine disease, right? So yep. this is a protein misfolding proteotoxicity model of Huntington's disease, clearly not the same as Huntington's disease, but right. suggesting that caffeine had some benefit in terms of maintaining protein homeostasis potentially. Yeah, and you mentioned the epidemiology uh, data, and I think beyond all-cause mortality, uh, the data is even stronger for Alzheimer's disease in those in those studies. Um, I think the uh, for all cause mortality, there is kind of a, a a sweet spot, maybe of a you know two to three cups a day. You know, take that with a grain of salt, of course. Yeah. Um, but I I think you keep getting protection against Alzheimer's disease way beyond that, from uh, what I remember. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. It's comp. I mean, uh, epidemiological yeah. studies are always complicated. Right. Yes. But yes, I think I think you're right. Certainly. For some age-related diseases, there doesn't seem to be an upper limit in yeah, terms right. of the the correlative benefit. Yeah, right? and, and to be clear, this is correlation, and we right. don't we don't have a causal link right. for this stuff. Nonetheless, I drink a lot of coffee, as do I. <laughs> so, um, so the other paper that I I really liked from your PhD was the study where you looked at dietary restriction in wild derived worms, and right. so um, so this act this paper. Uh, which was called Dietary Restriction by Bacterial Deprivation Increases Lifespan in Wild-Derived Nematodes, was actually a follow-up to the very first paper we published from the lab, which was uh, about lifespan, ex lifespan extension in worms from complete removal of food, right? right. And I, I, I like that paper as well for a couple of reasons. One is um, it, when we first started that study, the, the goal there was really to figure out, you know, what is the optimal amount of food you can give to worms for lifespan with the expectation that we would find some some level of caloric restriction below ad libitum that right. maximized lifespan. But if you took the food completely away, you would expect to shorten lifespan. Certainly that's right. what we see in people yep. <laughs> or in mice or even in flies. But what we found, you know, that we didn't expect was you could keep lowering and lowering and lowering the amount of food and the worms kept living longer and longer and longer and longer, right? All the way to zero. Yeah, all the way to zero in adulthood. If you do that during development, right. they don't develop. But if you wait till they're adults and past the first day of adulthood, it seems like that's the place, again, probably dependent somewhat on other conditions, right. where you get the maximum lifespan extension. So completely unexpected. So I love those kinds of experiments where you get a result that is not only very cool, but completely not what you expected. Right. And the other thing from that study, this we'll get to the the wild drive worms in a minute. The other thing from that study that I thought was interesting was when we combined this um what we call bacterial deprivation, right? So completely taking the food away with the DAF2 mutant, which is a long-lived mutant in the insulin pathway, we got this huge additive at least if not synergistic effect that led to like a threefold increase in lifespan. I mean, right. you know, huge and, and I went back and looked at this paper as I was sort of preparing for this talk. And, you know, it occurred to me, you don't really see those things anymore. Like, when was the last time you saw a new mutant or drug in worms that led to a threefold increase in lifespan? Yeah, it's it's pretty rare. So why is that? Like, why? I mean, why, this is something, I'm, I don't know the answer, I, but but why is it that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we were finding all these things. Not that's an outlier for sure, yeah. but we were constant. The feet, we being the field, we're constantly finding new things that gave 30, 40, 50 percent, and you put them together and you get 100 percent. And now today, people are celebrating 20 percent lifespan right. extension. What, it, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, is it just that we we caught the low hanging fruit early, uh, or was uh, I don't know? The, the, certainly, we haven't tested everything yet. So right, you, you I think we'd keep finding these I, things. I think part of it is there's just not a lot of the unbiased screening happening yeah. anymore. I mean, uh, this part reflects, I think, a transition in the field from discovery science to more mechanism based Absolutely. studies. 
I don't know. It's um, I, yeah. I wanted to ask you about this because you were you've been promoting this uh, early like unbiased screening, which is something I'm also interested in and that we do in the lab. But funding is an issue, right? So that it's hard to find funding to do that sort of very thing. difficult to get funding for non mechanism based yes. studies. You get the criticism that it's a fishing expedition, right? Right. Um, have so you I think found that's a big part of it. Have you found a solution to this? Like anyone? Yeah, who's leave academia. To find? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, unfortunately, not right. I think that was that was. <laughs> I'm being facetious, sort of, but um, I mean, I think that was part of my uh, rationale for for wanting to do something else was the fact that you know it's not just it's not just the sort of unbiased large scale discovery science frustrations, but just the fact that in in academia in particular, if you have a truly innovative idea that is not cookie cutter, right it is almost impossible to get it funded in less than five years yeah. and more likely 10 years because you have to go out and keep pushing and pushing and pushing and get preliminary data and string money together. So I had a couple of those in my career and I, you know, I got to the point where I'm starting to think to myself, like how many 10 year cycles do I have left? Yeah. The next time I have a big idea that I want to do, I don't want to have to spend 10 years trying to convince my peers that this is worth funding, right? So right. that I think that is an unfortunate aspect of where the sort of academic funding environment is right now. I would yeah. love to see more resources go towards, you know, truly innovative. And people say high risk, high reward all the time. It doesn't even have to be all that high risk. Right. There's a lot of there's a lot of what I call pragmatic moonshots out there where you're gonna learn something important, even if you don't get to the moon you're going to make a big impact, right? And yeah. it's just almost impossible to get those things funded. In th these days, we have these uh, robotic systems. You have, you're, you're, you've you're built one, uh, we're, we've built one in the lab that can measure the lifespan and do these things high throughput. So yeah, yeah what is the risk that you're not going to find something? It's fairly zero. low. Yeah. It's zero. Yeah. You will find interesting things exactly, if you yeah. test even 10,000 interventions, right. let alone 100,000 or a right. million. Yes. And and then it, that doesn't even get to the combinatorial effects where um, you we yeah. have all these individual interventions and then we what happens when they're combined? They they you see all the all the various patterns. They can be additive, they can be um, toxic when they're combined or they yeah. can be synergistic like we were talking about with the There's a, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there and um, yeah, it's it's a frustration. I I, I mean I don't want to get too negative, but yes, right. it is. It's a it's a frustration, and it would be. I think that there would be a lot of value if some of the resources that are flowing into the field yeah. would be put towards these pragmatic moonshots. And again, I think the high throughput screening is only one. There are others, but um, but it. Yeah. So it. Regardless, I mean, it did make me think when I look back at at this figure where you get this you know threefold increase in lifespan. Like, why aren't we seeing those things anymore? Yep. Yeah. We should be because, like you said, we've only looked at a tiny, tiny fraction of all the genetic and environmental or gene by environment interactions that are out there. That's not to it, mention all the drugs combination. The yeah, small molecules this is just a two-way combination of caloric restriction and insulin yeah. signaling behavior, right? right? There's lots of other stuff out there to be found. So, For sure. so it is. A, it's a little bit. Um, I don't know if discouraging is the right word. Concerning, maybe that we yeah. aren't finding things bigger than this routinely. Um, so anyways, but this, I think, set the stage for the paper that you published, which was taking, you know, what we had seen in the laboratory background, which is N2. So again, for those of you who aren't C. elegans aficionados, N2 is the standard C. elegans genetic background that's been used in probably 99% of the research work on C. elegans out there. But of course, C. elegans are all over the world. They're in soil and on rotting fruit and probably lots of other places. Yep. Lots of strains at that, that time had already been identified that are genetically diverse and different from N2. And one of the concerns about N2 and, and, and many of the other laboratory strains that are used in fruit flies and mice is when they're maintained in the lab for many, many generations, they are selected for that laboratory environment. For and sure. so you lose genes that are present in the natural environment when you're only working in a lab strain. Right. And so the question was, would caloric restriction or dietary restriction work the same way in natural populations? And so maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, why was that an interesting question to ask at that time? Uh, I mean, you've, you've noted that basically every worm lab in the world uses one strain of worm with a few exceptions. And uh, we know from 
So there's a there's a few studies in mice uh, with uh, a fairly you know small number of animals per group where there's uh, you see strains that respond positively to dietary restriction and strains that don't. Yeah. Um, and uh, so this was kind of a question along that same lines is like, will everyone benefit from this uh, this intervention if we're starting to apply um, interventions in the real world, which I know is an interest of OptiSpan? Uh, in, in human populations, we're genetically diverse. So if will these interventions work across genetically distinct individuals? Right. So th this is a way to get at that question. Yeah. And I think at that point, it was, uh, I, I, there was some data out there, but I think it was still a pretty unanswered question in the field, whether or not caloric restriction or other interventions that were known to extend lifespan in laboratory strains would work in wild strains. And there's, I think at the time, probably the study from Steve Ostad in mice where they had gone out and caught mice in the wild and brought them into the laboratory. And that study, it's still a classic paper, but but was sort yeah. of mixed results, right? I mean, yeah. it kind of worked, but some of the mice died early. And so, yeah. you know, um, and now we know from studies in, from from your work and studies in yeast and studies in fruit flies and studies in mice, that as you alluded to, the response to caloric restriction, a given level of caloric restriction is variable right. by, by genotype. And I would, you know, correct me if you have a different opinion. My sort of view is that those, the consensus from those studies is caloric restriction usually extends lifespan sure. when you look across a bunch of different genetic backgrounds, but sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it actually shortens lifespan. Right. And so then that raises, I think, the important consideration that if we want to start recommending caloric restriction or intermittent fasting or other interventions in people, we should do that with the understanding that there are probably some people where it's not going to work well for, and maybe even some people that are going to be harmed yes. by these kinds of interventions, almost certainly, right? Just based on our understanding of gene by environment. And I think this emphasizes the, the need for very personalized approach to uh, medicine in this space or or any space really where you really want to have uh, markers that you can follow yeah, to, biomarkers to, yeah. biomarkers to tr try and see if you're having the sort of effect that you want to have and not just like have a one size fit all solution right. for these things right yeah so let's go off on a little tangent I wasn't yeah, planning absolutely. to ask you this but what do you think about the biological aging clock since you brought up biomarkers um I, I I'm not it, by and large convinced that they're reporting biological age at this point. Um, I, I think they're probably the best, uh, some of the best tools we have for trying to get at that question now. And that the, that sort of approach where you, the, the, the clocks try to take uh, many, many uh, types of markers like gene expression data or different types of physiological data and combine those into a metric that gives you an idea of as a whole, where's biological age, right? So I think uh, in general, that's the right approach where you need to measure lots of things, maybe lots of different tissues and and get get at that. And I think eventually that will be um, probably the, the, uh, the thing that gets us to a some sort of a real biomarker we can use. Um, whether we're there yet is yeah. um, is less clear. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, also it's worth differentiating the kind of research use of these clocks yes. from the commercial use of these clocks. But For sure. I think the question I always have about the, you know, the epigenetic clock or the transcriptome clocks or, you know, you can build clocks off of almost any sufficiently high dimensional yes. data set that changes with age is those things are all trained on something that isn't exactly biological age, right? Yes. It's you know, chronological age or mortality risk or disease risk. And I understand why. Of course, you have to do that because we don't, I mean, it's a chicken and egg thing. We don't have a way to precisely measure biological age. So you can't train the clock on biological age. Yes. Yet we're, then once we train the clock, we're saying it is a measurement of biological age that we don't know how to measure. So it's, it, it, I don't have a solution, but it's a complicated sort of equation here that, that I think many of us are struggling with. Uh, this will be harder in humans, but I think in mice, you could potentially do this if, uh, you don't measure the age of the animal per se, but you you take measurements and then you measure remaining lifespan after that point. Right. And uh, that has been done once, I think, if, if there's one paper that's done something like that, right. using a frailty-based clock, if I remember. Um, but uh, most of these are just saying, how well are we measuring chronological right. age and using that as a surrogate for yeah. that. No, I think, you, I think you nailed it, actually. And I think that's, that's part of my skepticism of the utility of the biological age clocks, yes. as, at least as far as I know, what nobody has done yet is to 
take a collection of individuals. Again, you have to do this in mice because in people it would take too long to do it, although you could in principle do it in dogs as well. But take a collection of individual animals, treat some of them with an intervention. Maybe it's caloric restriction, maybe it's rapamycin, whatever. Something we know is going to increase lifespan and right. health span. Um, and then show that you can take a measurement, let's say at 20 months of age in a mouse, and predict with some level of accuracy remaining life expectancy, and then show in that same animal that indeed it actually predicted with some level of accuracy remaining life expectancy, right? Yes. That hasn't been done. So I think until that's done, I'm at least going to wonder, do these things actually work? Right. And the, uh, so a, a couple of questions on this, and maybe you know um, the answer in the human, uh, these big human cohort studies um, where maybe they have blood banked or things right. like that, where we have enough history of what, when those people ended up dying um, yep. after that collection. Uh, can we use that as a potential way to do this in humans? That's what people are doing. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. people so are taking good. historical sampled uh, biosamples, right? And then, and in fact, that's often how these clocks are trained in people, yeah, okay. right? So you you would take a sample from 20 years ago, right, or 10 years ago, and then look at across the population, three-year, five-year, 10-year mortality risk. And yeah, the clocks can sort of, they can predict with some level of accuracy. I think the question is, are they any more accurate than the other things that we can look at? So, so they're actually trained on mortality risk Sometimes. And, and not on uh on People have done the different things. Yeah, so the original so ones I, were all trained on chronological age. Okay. And then since then, people have trained different algorithms for mortality risk, like I said, three-year, five-year, 10-year, or even specific disease risk. Um, so, so they're getting more sophisticated in that way. I still... I don't know if worry is the right word. A limitation of that, of course, is, again, you're still not training on biological age. You're training right. on something that's correlated with biological that's right. age, right? Probably better than chronological lifespan, but... Right, right. Perfect. But there are yeah. obviously things that can affect your mortality risk that don't affect your biological age, right? Yeah, and so, if we have cause of death data, you could maybe exclude accidental death or other things that happen, but, sure. uh, but yeah, you so don't it's better, know. yeah. Um, uh, the other thing that I worry about a little bit with those human studies, though, is... You know, the human environment is changing so rapidly uh, yeah. that the things that influenced disease risk and mortality risk 20 years ago, they still are, some of them are still going to influence those things today. But there are a lot of new things that are influencing disease risk and mortality risk today that weren't an impact 20 years ago and vice versa. And we're much better at things like uh, uh, maintaining uh, some sort of life with cancer. And right. Things like keeping that. So people, things. keeping sick people alive. We've yeah. gotten very good at that. And so yes. that's going to affect your remaining lifespan measurement. Uh, the other worry I have about these clocks, in, and, and, and this is just an inherent limitation, is that we're measuring this in blood. So that's one tissue. Um, now, right. blood is probably one of the better ones because it's at least exposed to all of your different tissues. Um, but um, is that going to be enough to give you a, a, a wide enough view of, of the health of that individual to predict? Uh, I don't know. My, like my intuition is probably once the technology gets good enough, but it's a valid question. But people, of course, are building clocks off the microbiome and other sure. other things yeah. too, facial imaging clocks. Yeah. So and if again, you can start combining these things, right. then maybe I think that's what a lot of the yeah. a lot of the the um, computational groups are starting to move towards is combining different metrics of yep. biological age and then trying to get to a more comprehensive picture. And the, and the other dimension that uh, will hopefully give better results is uh, to do multiple layers of like transcriptomic, proteomic, right. uh, metabolomic right. and just get these multi-omic right. layers. Yeah. So regardless, uh, a little bit of a tangent. Okay, sure. now we'll get yep. back on course. But I, I think it is an important topic, obviously, that lots of people are interested Absolutely, in. Yeah. So, okay, so you finished your PhD, you graduated from University of Washington, you survived my lab, did a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went and did your postdoc at Jackson Labs. And I'm guessing a lot of people watching this aren't really familiar with Jackson Laboratories. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about Jax and the environment there and what what is Jax even all about? It's a kind of a unique in, in a lot of environment. Ways. Yeah, yeah, in a lot of ways it's unique. Uh, so, so Jackson Laboratory is uh, – they one thing that they do is they are the, the – major producer of research mice in the world. Uh, they produce millions of mice a year. They ship all over the world. Um, they provide most of the research mice, not all. There are comp competitors. Uh, but they're a nonprofit, and they, uh, instead of um, putting their uh, their profits in toward a, some sort of a profit-driven motive, they, they turn that into a research arm that acts something like an academic department in a university. So they have faculty, they have professors, 
and they have postdocs. They have a few graduate students from uh, partnerships with colleges, um, but they, they run labs and they do uh, basic research in the mice and they develop tools for doing mouse research. So if you want to do mouse research, this is probably the best place in the world to learn how to do it. And right. uh, that's why I went there. Right. Um, it was uh, at the time uh, they were looking for someone who knew who they were do just wanted to do a, a C. elegans RNAi screen. So I had that expertise coming in. So I went there and I, I helped them get that set up. And I was the only person doing worms at the Jackson Laboratory. Um, but then I got to learn how to do mouse aging studies. And the, there's other unique things about Jax. For example, it's uh, 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 in a small town in Maine, Bar Harbor. For right. those of you who have heard of that, um, it's right across the street from Acadia National Park. You can go walk in the park on your lunch breaks. Um, and there's... Uh, so basically, you're in rural Maine in this beautiful part of the country, and you get to do science. At a world-class research institution. At a world-class right? research institution. Yeah. So. yeah. And I have to say, I mean, I, I know many of the folks in the Aging Center at Jack's yeah. really well. One of my favorite places and one of my favorite groups of people. Me so, too. I mean, the, the yeah. people there are really just, they're really fantastic scientists, but also just really great human beings, right? So it's a it's a, it's a a neat place and very special. So. Absolutely. Um, okay, so, so you went to Jack's, and... Um, you had this training in CL again. So you said they were wanting to do an RNAi screen at that point. So That's right, yeah. why don't you just kind of take us through at a high level what you did for your postdoctoral research there and right. how that kind of got you to where you're at today? Yeah, um, I'll focus on the main screen that we published. There's another one that we worked on. Um, but uh, we, we ended up uh, w uh, collaborating with a, a group called the Charge Consortium. So this is a consortium of human cohort studies. So I think... Um, they have more than this, but the study we published uh, had data from 13 different human cohort studies, something about like around 15,000 individuals. Um, and from these studies, they had gene expression data. Um, in this case, it was microarray data um, from human whole blood. So this is uh, measuring um, kind of genome-wide gene expression in the blood. Um, for people from uh, basically the whole adult lifespan of humans. I think the youngest patient uh, sample was from a 17-year-old and the oldest was from a 104-year-old. Wow. So um, uh, you get the whole range. Um, and uh, that collaboration, the, the primary, um, the, the first primary result was just to see what genes change expression with age. And we identified about 1,500 genes. So these give you a correlative measurement. So these genes are changing with age, but we don't know yet whether they are causative in the aging process. Right. And that's what we wanted to use the word. Right. And I mean, just to, to, to cut in for a minute, I mean, this is actually the big challenge with the human yeah. studies, right? You can, you can do all sorts of correlative, uh, you can find all sorts of correlations, but how do you actually know that they're important for whatever it is that you're interested in, right? Right, that's right. Um, and so, right, so then the question was, you've got gene expression changes that change with age, mm -hmm. How do you know which ones are relevant for aging and which ones are maybe an effect of aging and which ones yes. are just random and have nothing that's to right. do with aging? Yeah, so that's the question right. that we came in with. <laughs> um, and so if you want to uh, determine a gene that's causative in aging, uh, the, the best metric we have is lifespan. So you, you've mentioned this on the podcast before, but um, if you, you want to shorten lifespan, there's lots of ways to do that that right. have nothing to do with aging. Um, but if you're going to extend lifespan, you, you've you you have to do something to improve the underlying pathway to aging. So uh, we did. We ran a screen where um, we took these fifteen hundred genes. We we just skimmed the the most significant uh, one hundred and twenty five off the top, um, and that that's what we screened. Um, we identified the the equivalent gene in the worm, um, and then we use a tool called RNA interference. Uh, so this is a tool where you're taking uh, a gene and you're knocking it down, not at the DNA level, um, but at the next level, at the mRNA level. Right. And so it redu it basically mostly eliminates the, the function of that gene. And this is one of the super powerful features of C. elegans, right, is that for, you know, many, many years now, there have been libraries of these RNAi clones where you yes. can kind of just, if you know you want to knock down gene X, you go to the freezer, you take out that clone, and you knock down gene X. That's so right. It's very, very easy in nematodes to right. knock down any gene of interest in principle. That's right. And so we had the library. We were able to just go in and get the genes out of the, out of the library and measure lifespan. Um, and uh, you've also talked about your experience sitting in a microscope measuring <laughs> chronological yeah. life or uh, replicative lifespan in yeast. Um, basically, in the the tr the traditional way of measuring worm lifespan is very similar. You have worm, uh, you know thirty or fifty worms on a little petri plate, and you go in with a little piece of platinum wire and you bop them on the head, see if they move, and then you. Uh, 
do that for its neighbor and the next one, and you do this every day until all the worms die. I'm sure many people watching this did not realize that the way the worm lifespan assay is is to works is to hit geriatric worms on the head with a that's pretty much yes. Stick. So um, we don't do it that way in humans. <laughs> so um, the, so I've spent uh, my thousands of hours at the the microscope not measuring uh, yeast lifespan, but measuring worm lifespan. Yeah. So I've I've also put in my hours. Yeah. Um, and uh, so yeah, we, we measured. Um, each of these genes. Um, so there's kind of a subtlety to worm lifespan in that the worms, are, unlike us, where we have a constant body temperature, the, the worms are the temperature of their environment. Right. Um, and uh, we've known for a while now that um, the temperature is a major determinant of the lifespan of the worm. So if you shift them from kind of their high temperature range, 25 degrees Celsius, down to l the lower end of their temperature range, 15 degrees Celsius, you can about double their lifespan. Right. And different molecular processes can affect aging at different temperatures. So we decided in this screen to screen every gene at both the 15 degree time uh, temperature point and the 25 degree temperature point. Right. See if we could yeah. hit that variation. And just for anybody who may be wondering, should you go out and freeze yourself? Um, that probably isn't going to work in humans because we that's thermo a good regulate point. ourselves. Yes. <laughs> so you, you are not the temperature so of that environment. Is, you know, I know people are into the cold plunges and all of that. That if that has a benefit for longevity, it's yes. probably through a different mechanism. Yeah, so that is probably <laughs> worm specific. And the reason we did it was not for that, but because different genes affect longevity at different temps. Right. So we wanted to capture as much as possible as, in terms of like positive. And I think we still don't completely understand why it is that worms and, and flies age more slowly at low temperature. I mean, people, you know, people talk about the rate of living theory and slower yep. metabolism. I'm sure that's part of it. But it's not so clear to me why you get these pretty dramatic differences in the genetic determinants of longevity at different temperatures if it all comes down to thermodynamics, right? That doesn't right. doesn't quite add up. So there's something else going on there that we. I, don't I think it's almost certainly more complicated than that. Um, probably the worms are regulating metabolism in different ways at different temperatures. Right. Um, certainly they get different pathology at low versus high temperatures. Right. So, um, yeah. So I, the. As with everything in aging, it's going to be more complex than a single answer. Right. Okay. So, so, so again, just to sort of recap, you started with gene expression studies in humans, found gene human genes that were changed with age. Yep. Did a mapping onto the C. elegans genome to say which one of those have functional equivalents. Those are called orthologs. Yes. In worms, and for those that had orthologs in worms, you measured lifespan by knocking them down. Now, maybe one thing to appreciate here is, is I'm sure you knew the directionality of the gene expression change in humans, whether it was an increase or decrease with age, That's right. but you were really only going one direction in worms. Yep. And even from the directionality in humans, you can come up with plausible hypotheses for, for why something that would increase that when you decrease it in worms would inc would increase lifespan or vice versa sure. but it's just worth it's just worth noting that cuz the goal here is to ask you know of the genes that are changing with age in people which ones are also affecting lifespan yep. in worms you're really only looking at half the equation in that's right. principle if your readout is increased lifespan yes that's right so we're we're not going to catch things that are benef genes that are beneficial for lifespan because we're not um, doing the opposite screen which would be an over over expression right. screen. and again just to 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 hammer the nuance a little bit you will see, in, in theory, that those genes, when you knock them down, shorten lifespan in yes. worms, but you kind of ignore it because that's a very nonspecific phenotype. Right. Again, there are many things that, that you could do that would shorten lifespan in a worm or a mouse or a person that has nothing to do with aging. Yes. Right? So you that's look right. at the specific phenotype, which is lifespan extension. That's right. Got it. And uh, uh, it, this is a technical limitation where it's easy to knock genes down. It's hard to overexpress them. Though so there are, uh, I'm, I hear that there are tools that are just coming out that maybe will have a feeding based system for overexpression. That would be fantastic. And again, just to tie it back to a point we were making earlier about how much of the sort of landscape is unexplored, Absolutely. that overexpression landscape in every organism is almost completely unexplored. It and is. there's a really, really a bunch of interesting stuff to find. So I, I know you know Alatine Kaya. Yep. Again, very fantastic. Scientist um, uh, uh, has done a small overexpression screen in yeast and found that you know something like forty percent of the essential genes when you overexpress them can increase lifespan. I mean that's just 
Yeah. Mind blowing. And, um, and this so there's a huge even, amount of interesting stuff to be found there. Yeah. And this doesn't even get to dose. In both the knockdown screens and the overexpression screens, usually you're doing right. one copy overexpression or you're knocking the gene all the way down. There's right. there's a whole subtlety in how, what the right dosing of each gene is. All right, so now it's going to go on a different tangent because here's a sort of a philosophical question I've wondered about, thought about a few times, which is if you took a look at every gene in the genome, yep. how many of them are optimized dose-expression-wise dose, -wise, dose expression -wise for lifespan? For lifespan, <laughs> um, none. Right. Well, well, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe by some accident, of them are. Yeah. but not by selection. So right, then the yeah. question becomes, I mean, I think people are often shocked at how many genes can affect lifespan, like increase lifespan by yes. changing dose. But I think a different way to look at it is, you know, natural selection has optimized nothing for longevity, right? right? In most species. Maybe there are a few outliers, but in most species, it's, the optimization is not for longevity. So in principle... Every gene, every protein is at a suboptimal level for longevity. Right. Right. And so that maybe it shouldn't be so surprising that there are lots and lots of genes we can tweak. And if we get the dosage just right, we can have a probably in most cases, small effect, but an effect on longevity. So. Right. And I, this was actually an early revelation in my own exploration of aging is like, why, why would you, um, why are we not selected for a longer lifespan? And uh, just a, an illustrative example is a lot of things that um, we find that increase lifespan have some sort of detriment on reproductive health right. early in life. Right. And so that where natural selection evolution is selecting for um, fitness of the organism as a, as a species and not for the, long, the, the fitness of an individual in terms of how long it's alive. And so if you have a trade-off between reproduction and longevity, the, oftentimes the reproduction is going to win. Uh, and then if you break that, you maybe get a lifespan extension. Right. right. So, I mean, I think it's an interesting sort of theoretical question. Like, if you could optimize every gene in the genome for longevity, how good could you do? Like, we don't know, obviously. Right. But maybe a lot. <laughs> yes. Could be quite a lot. Yeah. So, so I mean, it, it, it is, uh, again, just getting back to the point, lots and lots of really interesting stuff that could be done, should be done, isn't being done because the funding agencies are not funding these kinds of studies. Okay. Right. Anyways, we'll drop that. Okay. So, so you looked at, so this is a graphic from the paper you published. You looked at 82 genes by RNAi, or at least that's how many were in this figure. Does that sound right? Uh, that, that's right. So I think there were 87, so there were 125 human genes that we started with. 87 of those had clear functional equivalents in worms. So worms are not humans. They're not all going to have right. the same one. And uh, we had RNAi available for 82. So we ended okay. up screening 82. Okay. And 36 of those increased lifespan. Uh, yes. At 25 degrees. Fewer at 15 degrees. Okay. So let's just go with the 25. Yep. Um, I think some people watching this probably don't appreciate whether that's an impressive statistic or not. That is a, a, a very high number. So we also did a, ran, a random set of genes as a control. And uh, I don't remember the exact number, but it was maybe one or two of those on yeah, that so order. Far fewer, right? Far, so far we wouldn't fewer. expect, I mean, and people have done genome-wide RNAi screens, yes. right? If you look across thousands of genes, the hit rate, I think, is around 2.5% maybe yes. in worms. So this is getting up to, you know, 30, 40%, 40%, yep. I guess. So this is a major enrichment. And the, right. the enrichment... At least uh, the idea here is that the enrichment is coming from the fact that we started with genes that change expression with age in humans. And that is, it seems right. like a good way to select for aging and, or pro longevity. And this is certainly consistent with the idea that genetic control of longevity is conserved between worms and humans, at least to some extent. Again, not everything is going to work the same way, but many things apparently do. And so these are high priority sort of interesting yep. candidates to think about for modulators of mammalian longevity, human longevity. And I think that sort of sets the stage for kind of what you've done since then, right? Yes. And so number three on this list, I think, is the, yes. the what's the gene? Uh, kinurininase. Kinurininase. Yes. <laughs> Figuring out how to pronounce the pathway was the biggest challenge here. <laughs> so, okay. So why did you get it? Why did you pick that one out as potentially the most interesting? Um, the the main reason was it it was the 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 single gene in this set that um, gave a, a robust extension of lifespan at both 15 and 25 degrees. Okay. So this was um, sort of context independent, at least in terms of temperature. Um, and it was also one of the largest effect size. So we're getting about a 25% 
uh, change in lifespan, which is, uh, you mentioned there are bigger things, but that's kind of the, the level where we start getting excited about right. something. Below that, it's kind of hard to replicate. So. Yeah, so that's I'm glad you brought that up, just again, as a little tangent for the people listening. I try to sprinkle in kind of the way I think about yes. the literature as I'm reading it, and there are just a bunch of C. elegans papers out there with 10%, 15% lifespan extension 5%. effects. 5%. 5%. That I would say it's you're lucky if half of them are reproducible. So I typically tend to, unless I see multiple labs getting the 15% effect with the same intervention over and over, I kind of just don't even pay any attention. If it's if it's not 20%, like come back to me when somebody else has replicated well, it. And you've just brought up another challenge in the field is that replication is almost never done. Um, we're, we're starting to do this with a lot of these genes. I try to pick yeah. out papers where a drug extends lifespan and we and we have a, this system where we can kind of do high throughput. So we're trying to run these through and see which ones of them uh, will replicate in, uh, in another lab's hands. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. I mean, I think that's important. And, you know, again, this is part of the challenge um, with the longevity field getting more and more attention. Yes. I, what you start to see often is, you know, some paper will come out, some some lab that, as far as I know, has never done aging research studies before, will publish something in C. elegans, some, you know, I don't know, bark extract from some tree I've never heard right. of that, that increases, slows aging, increases lifespan, improves health span, and, and then doesn't even say in the title in C. elegans. Right. You look at the paper, it's like a 10% effect. You're kind of like, eh, it's probably not real, but we don't know. And yet, and then people are trying to sell the supplement for this thing and say you should take it as a longevity. Yeah, system. yeah. So, so it's a problem. You, you've mentioned one thing. You, I always pull those figures up, and the, there's two things I look at. Um, what is the lifespan of the control? Ah, uh, that's this another is issue. Yes, yes a big, a big <laughs> problem. So, especially in labs um, or um, new people who come into the into the lab and are just learning C. elegans yeah. lifespan, we kind of don't usually use those first few experiments just because they're learning how to do it. The lifespan is invariably shorter than right. the average. Uh, the normal like average right. lifespan in the lab, right. and so you'll see that in a lot of these papers where you know our our lab typically gets a, a median lifespan of about twenty one days in worms. Yeah, and that's um, at twenty degrees, and that's at twenty degrees. Um, and a, a lot of these papers you'll see t twelve sometimes yeah. or fifteen, and like yeah. and so if you're starting with a short lived animal, then it's maybe yeah. easier to. I, I'm sure you remember many group meetings where somebody would show an experiment. I'd be like, "Why are your controls so short lived?" Right. That's right. <laughs> Go do the experiment again because that doesn't look right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, there are lots of issues there, having the right controls, make, and the reason we have controls is so that we know if they don't look right, that something went wrong and you need to do the experiment again. But, but in, in this context, I think it's it's useful to bring some of these subtleties up. Like if, if you don't aren't familiar with the field or the model organism, you yeah. wouldn't know to look for these kind of red flags with that. And certainly, um, you know, scientific journalism is its whole other um, yeah. uh, pr uh, discussion. But um, somebody who's not look, who is not familiar with worms or mouse studies will not know yeah. um, whether that's a, a, a like a good finding. or Yeah. Not. So, yeah. So I'm going to record an episode on the sort of short-lived control problem and do a little right. bit of a deeper dive. But yes, I mean, it's, you know, I sort of harp on it in mice because I think those are the most damaging papers. Absolutely. But it's true in every model system, right? You see it in fruit flies, you see it in C. elegans, you see it in yeast, that there are lots and lots of studies that get published where the the control, the wild type, the untreated, is shorter lived than it should be based on what everybody else gets. Yep. And there's a lifespan extension that brings the short lived control up to where they should have been. And almost invariably, that proves not to be reproducible. That's right. So, anyways, okay, that was a tangent. But so you focused on the kynurinine pathway. Yep. Kynurinase was the. Kynurinase. What? Ky uh, say it, it again. Kynurinin. <laughs> Can urinanase. Can urinanase. All right. <laughs> Can urinanase. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first few lab meetings it, back in the Corstania lab uh, where we discovered this were interesting because uh, all of us were sitting there trying, everyone pronouncing it differently. Okay. So you found this gene. Yes. <laughs> you can call you it kind of one. It's, and, and you got interested in it because it, it was robust for lifespan extension. It worked across temperatures. It's also sort of an interesting metabolic pathway. That's right. right. Yeah. So we'll put the graphic up, but why don't you take us through the pathway that this gene is involved in? Right. So this is uh, the kinurinin pathway. Um, it's named for uh, one of the metabolites in the pathway. But uh, what this path this pathway does is it processes tryptophan. So tryptophan is uh, an amino acid. We primarily get it from our food. 
Um, and uh, so tryptophan has a lot of interesting things. It's an amino acid, so it builds protein. Um, it's also a precursor for serotonin and melatonin and some of these uh, neuroactive compounds in our, that our body use. Right. Um, and those are kind of the better known uh, places that tryptophan gets used. Um, and But if you add all those other ones up, that consumes maybe 5 to 10% of the tryptophan we ingest. The rest of it, 90 to 95%, goes through this pathway called the kinurinin pathway. Uh, it has a lot of side branches, um, but the, the main endpoint of the pathway is uh, uh, NAD, uh, which is a, a well-known molecule in the aging right. field. Um, and we, uh, in this case, uh, the gene is, uh, encodes an enzyme that carries out one of these metabolic steps between tryptophan and NAD. And so when we knock that down, we're essentially blocking this pathway, and that's what's giving us lifespan. And so the gene was the KYNU? KYNU, right? yeah. So it actually, so there's a, this branch, and this gene is involved in both branches where you go from, this 3HK? Yes, so 3HK to 3HA. What is 3HK? 3-hydroxykinurinin. Uh, okay, and 3HA we'll talk more about. Yes. That's what? 3-hydroxyanthranilic acid. Okay, so you knock down this gene and you would expect that you're going to inhibit both branches and have less 3HAA? Yes, so when you knock this gene down, um, what you expect, so normally it turns 3HK into 3HA, um, so what you'd expect when you knock this down is to get elevated 3-HK and reduce 3-HA, and that is what we see when we measure it. Okay, and, and that uh, increases lifespan. Yeah, and it, this also converts kinurinin, KYN, to anthranilic acid, uh, AA, and you see the same thing. So you get less anthranilic acid and more kinurinin. Okay, and the prediction would be then less NAD through this pathway? Yes, um, though it's it's maybe not as much as you'd expect. Um, it's You get maybe a... 10% reduction in NAD. Is that because NAD is coming from other places That's as well? That's right. Yeah, so in humans, uh, we the, the main source of NAD is through our diet and through recycling uh, nicotinamide um, to, through the salvage pathway back to NAD. Got and it. So that's where most of it's coming from. Okay, so clearly an interesting metabolic pathway tied into NAD, which is interesting for yep. aging, tied into tryptophan, which is interesting for aging. So good reason to look at it. Okay. Yep. So then you started looking more closely and you've sort of, you can take us through how you ended up at 3HAA. Yes. Sort of an interesting story. Right. Uh, so uh, one, one other aside on the pathway is that it's highly conserved from bacteria all the way mm. through humans. So this is one of the better conserved pathways in biology. Um, so another reason to look at it is that it's um, it's in humans, it's linked to disease in humans. And what so, are the diseases? Um, so the uh, we, we'll get a little more into this later, but the pathway is activated by inflammation. Mm. Um, so anytime you have inflammation, you basically see this pathway turn on. Uh, and and that, what's the readout for that? When you say pathway turned on, what does that mean? Uh, so you can measure the metabolites in the pathway. So these 3HA, 3HK, kinurinin, um, you see these go up when there's uh, uh, infl inflammatory signaling happening. And is that because you're getting more flux from tryptophan or because you're getting things backed up from the bottom, right? Because you can yeah. see increases in intermediates right. either way. It's a good question. Uh, so the, the gene that is uh, primarily inflammatory responsive is at the top of the pathway and... Uh, so the uh, the very first step in the pathway converting tryptophan to N formal kinurinin, which is NFK. Um, in in worms, there's only one gene that uh, or one enzyme that carries out this reaction, TDO or TDO2. Um, in mammals, there are three. There are two IDO genes and one TDO gene, and one of these IDOs is in the immune system and is the gene that turns on in response to inflammation. So when you get inflammation, IDO gets upregulated and it starts converting tryptophan into the first metabolite in this pathway, NFK, and that starts the cascade and you Got get upregulation of everything. So do you see there. a depletion of tryptophan then? You do. And actually, one you asked what diseases uh, this pathway has been implicated in. One of them is cancer. So cancers will um, kind of hijack this pathway and turn on IDO uh, to deplete their local microenvironment of tryptophan. Mm -hmm. And what that does is uh, T cells, so immune cells, that um, one of their jobs is to re remove cancerous cells right. or problematic cells. Uh, they need tryptophan in their environment to survive. If they don't have it, they will apoptose, they will die. Interesting. And so the cancer cells will get rid of the tryptophan in their environment by turning on this kinurinin pathway uh, in order to kill the local T cells and evade the immune surveillance. And this is one one way they they result in tumor growth. Got it. Interesting. Okay. So 
in addition to the reasons why you thought this was interesting, highly conserved and disease relevant. Right. right? And, so, and other diseases are Alzheimer's disease and in any inflammatory disease, this pathway goes up like aging. aging. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So lots of different disease yeah. connections. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, okay. okay. So then take us through the process here. Right. So the, the first step, we, we saw that we could block this pathway um, and get a lifespan extension. So the, the natural next step is that this is one enzyme among probably 12 or 13 different enzymes in this pathway. So the first step was like, okay, let's just take a broader look at the pathway, see if this is something specific to Kainu, or if there are other enzymes that can do this. Um, so in worms, it's easy to knock down one gene, hard to knock down multiple genes. And that's important in this pathway, because if you look at the genes encoding the enzymes in this pathway, most of them have more than one gene. For example, there's this enzyme AFMID. There are two genes encoding AFMID. There are two genes encoding this enzyme at KMO. Uh, but there are three genes in the pathway that are easy to knock down because there's only one gene. That's TDO2, that first gene in the pathway, Kainu, which we'd hit in the screen, and the next enzyme down, uh, the gene encoding that how or how one uh, was also a single gene. So we knocked those down first, and it turned out all three of them were able to give you a lifespan extension. Um, the, the TDO2 had been previously reported by a different lab. Um, so that one wasn't novel, but how had not been reported, and that one gave us um, the biggest lifespan effect. Mm. Um, so Kainu gave us maybe a 20 to 25% lifespan extension. Knocking down how gave us about a 30% lifespan extension. And so because of that bigger effect, we decided to focus there initially. Which is often how it works in science. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so the, the bigger the, the change, the easier it is to measure and the easier yeah. it is to figure out what's going on under the surface. And um, so this was actually what launched my independent lab after I left Jackson Laboratory at the University of Arizona and probably still uh, maybe a third of the lab studies, this molecule or this uh, enzyme how and uh, the molecule 3HA. Um, the other thing about the how gene that was interesting, um, so when we run our experiments, we blind the person scoring the experiment so they don't know which gene they're looking at at any right. given time. So there's no bias going in. Or that's the idea. Um, but this, uh, this gene was a problematic in that there was a, a secondary phenotype that kept showing up. And uh, we kept seeing uh, um, plates of worms where the worms would turn red as they got older. Um, and it turned out that those also were the worms that were consistently long lived <laughs> and that that was the knockout of this gene. Yeah. So let's come back to that in a second, but yep. let's, let's just take a stop to double click on what you said. Cause again, I think this is in, an important, um, nuance to doing good science, right? right? And you, so you said that the people in your lab are blinded and what that means is we don't actually physically blind them or put a blindfold on them, no, but they don't right. know of the let's just say in this case, you have plates of animals that are treated differently. So 30 animals on this plate are getting the RNAi, 30 animals on this plate are not, 30 animals on this plate are getting the drug. Right. The person doing the experiment doesn't know which is which. That's right. right? And that's a key part of, of sort of uh, the, the rigor and control process in scientific experimentation. Whenever possible, you're better off if the human being doing the analysis doesn't actually know which is the control and which is the experimental right. condition. And we don't expect people to be dishonest in their scoring, but you know, you kind of get attached to the things you're uh, There's human you're bias saying. involved. Yeah. yeah. What you expect to be the outcome can right. impact what you see. For yeah. Sure. Or if, if there's motivation, right? You, you want there to be a lifespan right. extension. So if you're, if you know you're measuring this gene, how one, and this is the plate that there, you might be, yeah. you know, subtle, even unconscious changes in the way you're measuring that. Uh, I just wanted to double click on that because I actually think that's the exception rather than the rule yeah, in absolutely. most labs. And so, you know, I think that this is a problem in some ways with the training that many people get. They don't, they aren't trained to appreciate, like, why are we, why do we have a negative control? Why do we have a positive control? Yep. Why would you do this blinded, right? So it's just, it's, it's useful to just reiterate that. I'm sure there are some scientists watching right now who in their own lab don't do this. Maybe they'll think about adding a sort of blinding process in their experiments. Right. Yeah. And now, um, you know, the the next, the even better step. So now we use machines to right. measure these things, which completely eliminates the human bias. You have right. other technical challenges in that case, but at least that part of it is completely right. And potentially other them. sources of bias. Like, I think this is why you in, in science, you always want to be at least thoughtful about right. where are the places where we might be introducing something that could cause us to get an answer that isn't exactly correct. Right. right? And there are and, all sorts of 
places where that can happen. And I mean, we've had these challenges. So we, we work with other labs and we try to replicate their results. Um, uh, we do this with Scott Leiser's lab at the University of Michigan all the time. Uh, and, you know, so we'll come up with things that um, in our lab, it's not working. It was working in his lab. And, and then yeah. you have to go back to the drawing board and kind of go through all the detail of that experimental setup and figure out what's different in these two cases. Yeah. And that uh, this is, again, the problem of replication, where when things aren't replicated in different locations, uh, you don't have that um, rigor it built into those studies. Right. OK, so sorry I interrupted. So anyways, you uh, saw that the plates turn different colors. Right. Uh, not the plates, the worms. So <laughs> the worms, yeah, turn, the worms different turn different colors. So they would build up <laughs> some sort of a red pigment uh, ah, okay. in their in their body. So uh, I guess this is a, a point. The worms are transparent. Right. So you look under the microscope and you could see all of their internal organs. And uh, and this was an advantage in this case. And we still use the fact that uh, we can see this buildup of a red coloration in these animals. Right. But again, I think this is an interesting example of, you know, the benefit to paying attention, right? right? This is a pretty extreme case. Yes, if your worms turned red, most people are going to notice that. But right. I think, you know, certainly in my own scientific career, it's sort of, you know, littered with weird observations. Yeah. Again, this gets back to not what you expected, but they turn out to be important. And so, you know, being cognizant of strange things that happen. A lot of times strange things happen in an experiment for strange reasons. Somebody yep. did something dumb or mixed the wrong tube or whatever. But you want to But know sometimes about they're really for really interesting reasons. Okay. Well, and <laughs> this actually is a, a problem with the robotic systems, right? So a disadvantage is that humans are not looking at that data every day. Right. And so that you, if there was something weird like this, we wouldn't have caught it if uh, it was on right. one of these robotic systems. Right. So we just need better AI to do that. Yeah, that's right. So. <laughs> okay. So you had red worms. Right, so red worms. Um, so if we look at the structure of the pathway, uh, what this gene how, uh, or this enzyme how does is it converts uh, free HAA to ACMSA, and I'm not gonna say that one out loud because it's, <laughs> it's about a, a 30 character long molecule. Okay. Um, uh, so what you'd expect to happen if you knock this down, uh, as we talked about before, is that you get a buildup of 3HA and an, a reduction of downstream uh, metabolites. And that's um, what we saw. So when we uh, looked at mass spec data, sure enough, 3HA was building up. And when we bought a bottle of 3HA from the chemical supplier and put it in the plates, it was red. So that kind of uh, matches what we were seeing in the worm. What we think we're seeing is the, is the physical buildup of 3HA in the animal. Got it. And that, of course, leads to a hypothesis. If these worms are long lived, they're building up this metabolite. Maybe that metabolite is the thing that is good for the worm and extending lifespan. And this is not necessarily true because it could be something about blocking downstream processes that's good and it could be something further upstream, but it at least gives us a clear hypothesis to test. Right. And that's what we did. And so you did it. And what's yep. the outcome? And 3HA, if you just feed it to the worm, uh, <laughs> it gives you a nice dose dependent increase in lifespan, maxing out about around one millimolar in the plates. And uh, at that one millimolar point, it looks, the lifespan curve is uh, right on top of the how knockout worm. So it looks like it's replicating the So that's kind of like the, the, the maximum you can get and it matches the genetic knockdown. Yeah. And we think it's close to the maximum. You can actually put 3HA on a how knockout worm and get a little bit better. So they're probably okay. not quite optimized, yeah. um, but they're close. Yeah. And so this was published in Nature Communications in 2023. Yeah, so we'll just, get, there's more interesting data in that paper. Definitely, but, yeah. Um, so one question though. So, so you can, you can increase lifespan with 3HA mm -hmm. and the worms turn red in the how knockout. What happens if you knock down Kainu in that cont in the how knockout? Yes. They don't turn red, I assume? They do not turn red. Um, they are still long-lived, but then the Kainu knockdown alone is long-lived. Right. So we've combined Kainu knockdown with Hau knockdown, and it looks... So they're both long-lived, so it's a little hard to tell, but they look closer to the Kainu lifespan in that case. So it looks like yeah. that's the, the dominant phenotype. So, I mean, very cool, but very weird. Like, like right. what do you think the mechanism... So I think we'll move towards 3HA being important. That's right. presumably the mechanism in the how knockdown. Right. What do you think is increasing lifespan in the Kainu knockdown? Something different? Oh, so certainly something different. We don't know. We've done the same experiment where you add back the upstream metabolites for Kainu and we get a small lifespan extension, but it's not as clear as the 3HAs. What happens if you combine exogenous 3HA with the Kainu knockdown? Um, you get additive extension. Okay, so, so yeah. that, that fits with different mechanisms, That's right. right? Yeah, okay. so you can uh, you can further extend the Kainu by adding back that 3HA, which is not present in right. the Kainu. Animal. And again, this is a little bit of a tangent, but 
Um, again, just for people who maybe haven't thought a lot about genetic epistasis or you know yes. longevity epistasis, those are not the same thing, by the way. But <clears throat> in general, if you have two things that increase lifespan and you combine them and you get an additive effect that is consistent with a model that they're acting through different pathways. You can, it's not always gonna be the case. You can come up with ideas around how maybe you're not fully optimized for pathway one, but it's more typically going to be the case that you would have one thing acting in pathway one, one thing acting in pathway two, and that's why you get an additive or synergistic effect on longevity when yeah, you combine them. That's right. And this was not the expected result here, right? right? So if you have three genes that you're knocking down in the same pathway, the kind of first pass hypothesis would be that those so are we're, doing we're, the same thing. We're probably getting, we're probably confusing ourselves and other people by using pathway to mean two different things here, right? So there's the longevity oh. pathway, and there's That's the fair. metabolic pathway. The and metabolic I think, pathway yeah, in this right. case. I think yeah. what we're suggesting is that the metabolic pathway per se is not mapping onto lifespan directly. Yeah. Not, so yeah, that's right. It looks so. like there's two different things, this metabolic path, two different mechanisms potentially by which the same metabolic pathway is impacting lifespan. And probably three because that first that I, I alluded to another paper that had looked at TDO2 previously and they they think it was tryptophan buildup that was actually extending lifespan in that case, which okay. would also not be the expected result for Kainu or how. And so there's probably multi multiple things happening in this pathway that are and maybe we'll come back to this if now is not the right time to talk about it. But what about NAD that sits at the bottom of the pathway? How yeah, this, is, do you do you have a feel for how that ties into these? Do you think either Kainu or how is working ultimately through NAD? Um, so this is probably the most common question I get uh, because NAD is such a major force in the aging field, and uh, it doesn't look like it. So we um, so there's there's papers out there that show that if you supplement with an NAD precursor, you can extend worm lifespan. Um, there's at least one study showing Do lifespan. Do you believe that? In mice. Uh, Do you not want to answer that, that? No, that is where I'm going, actually. So um, I cannot replicate any of those experiments. Okay. So I've, I've tried. You're not alone. Yeah, but... that's right. So I've, I've tried all of the precursors. I've tried, it, I've tried doing full dose responses, different experimental conditions, different ways of adding it to the media. I can't get a lifespan extension. So um, I don't think that that is, um, A, I don't think it's relevant to what 3HA is doing. Um, partially there, it's because the effect is in the wrong direction, right? So right. you knock out how you you expect to, and you do get a small decrease in NAD, which is the opposite of what you'd expect if NAD is right. a beneficial during aging. Right. So I, uh, I don't think so. Um, there, We had hoped, actually, that we could replicate that NAD finding because then you could maybe knock out how and add NAD precursors yeah. and get a do double benefit, but that uh, we've not been able to. Yeah, do. so I'll have to do a deeper dive on NAD, but I mean, that's sort of reminiscent of the whole resveratrol story right. in yeast. We wanted to we wanted to use resveratrol as a tool to test a model, yet we couldn't ever replicate the published results for lifespan extension. That's right. Yeah. So frustrating, but um, not atypical. Okay. Anyways, let's not talk about NAD. All right. <laughs> uh, at least for a little bit. Okay. So the dice dose response, you could get this nice lifespan extension from just adding 3HA to the plates. The plates yep. turned orange, so you probably couldn't do those blinded really yep. easily. But That broke our, our blinding again. Okay. So then you went to mice because you would obviously want to know, is this working in a mouse? And you took a couple of strategies there. So yeah, let's talk right. about the genetic strategy first. How did this okay. come about? Um, so uh, yeah, so we wanted to replicate these findings in mice. Uh, and there's a uh, a, a big effort out there to basically knock out every every gene in the mouse called the International Mouse Knockout Consortium, which is, they're, they're actually done with that part of it. They've at least knocked out every gene at the embryonic stem cell level. Um, and then a lot of these are now living mice that are lacking a single gene. Right. Um, so this but us, again, maybe just worth clarifying, there are a whole set of genes that are what are called essential genes that's right. that you can't knock out. Yep. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a great resource, but not yep. a complete collection of all the genes in the genes. Yes, and this is true across organisms. There are, you mentioned in the in the yeast right. replicative lifespan discussion, uh, yeah, if, if a gene is required for life, you knock that out, you're not going to be able to right. measure lifespan. Lifespan is zero. Well, you can that's measure true. it. Oh, that's true. It's very yeah. easy to measure. Yeah, it's you don't even easy. need to do the experiment. Right, and it's zero variability, so <laughs> right. it's great. Um, but it turns out that how is among these genes that uh, is non-essential, and uh, you can knock it out. The mice look pretty normal. Um, I, you can't tell them apart by eye. In fact, you can't really tell them apart unless you're doing some sort of a molecular measurement or a longer term measurement like lifespan in this case. Right. And uh, we, we uh, put these mice on the shelf and we measured lifespan. 
Um, I, I would like to point out before we go into that these studies are small. These were pilot studies. So the, um, the genetic study, I think, had about 20 mice per group, um, which is... Um, and when you I, say per, per group, are those pooled males and females? Or? I think, oh, so it's 20 male controls, 20 male how knockouts, 20 female controls, 20 uh, female how knockouts. Okay. So we have about 80 mice total, which is underpowered. So it's, it's less mice than you really want to get statistical power to find lifespan extension. So that, that's a, a, a limitation to this study going in. Okay. Um, but it turns out that we did actually find lifespan extension. Um, if you pool the males and females, it was about... Uh, fifteen percent, and uh, the males were uh, they were trended long lived, but not quite significant, and the females were long lived. Got it. Um, and so there's there seems to be a sex specific effect here. Um, but we were able to replicate the the least basic finding in worms that the mice look like they're probably long lived. Again, we need to validate this with a bigger study. And these were black six mice. These were yep C fifty seven black six mice, which okay. is the most commonly used strain. And you were also able to see sort of whopping increases in 3HA in blood and urine. Which uh, is definitely. What you would Very high levels. Um, yeah, it seems like most of the 3HA is dumped into the urine and excreted. Um, but we did see a, a, a decent amount of circulating. And if you were to just measure your 3HA in your blood right now or in a mouse, um, yeah. it's very low. So usually this molecule is degraded and not in circulation. I'm guessing nobody has done this, but is there any data on variation in 3HA levels in people in urine or blood? Uh, I don't think. I think so. We've started to do some of this, um, and we don't really have a, a solid answer yet. Um, so the, the history of this pathway is that there has been interest in this pathway, but it's really uh, centered around the, that IDO gene that's uh, upregulated in cancer and that's inflammatory responsive. There's a few other genes that have been kind of targets, and most people measure the metabolites that are around those. So you get a lot of measurements of tryptophan and kinurenin, but not much of the other metabolites. And that's starting to change, but okay. um, uh, it's not one that's commonly measured. And I hesitate to ask this, but um, is 3HA something that you can buy, and is it orally bioavailable? I'm not suggesting anybody take it. I'm just then trying to think through like, yes. are there artificial, are there ways that you could in a clinical setting raise 3HA levels in urine and then, you know, do a short-term study, safety studies, things so, like that? This is not a molecule you could go to your supplement store and buy. It's not on Amazon. Right. Yeah. But you can buy it from chemical suppliers and uh, it is orally available. So that the other study we did was a dietary study of 3HA. Right. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Next. So yeah. yeah, it is orally available. You have to, you have to put a lot in there to get, um, uh, to get the blood level to go up. So it's not like super available. Um, and is that because of uptake or because of uh, kidney or liver or do we know i, I don't th we don't know okay. um I, I suspect it's a combination of uh it's i not bet the microbiome probably can I, use it i mean uh, I, metabolic pathways can. there right? yeah the bacteria have the pathway um it's not very soluble so it's uh it does probably does not get into the body very well and okay. then most of it gets secreted immediately so, okay. uh, so there's a lot of complications okay. um, there are two um known how inhibitors out there um which uh, both of them are um, related to a, a, a 3HA analog. So a, a molecule that looks a lot like 3HA, but it has a different chemical side group. So it sticks to the same pocket in the How enzyme and basically blocks 3HA from being able to stick there. So <laughs> it it's a competitive inhibitor of 3HA. Are these FDA approved? They uh, are not. Um, and uh, they have some of the same problems with 3HA in that they're um, not very soluble and they're hard to get into the body. Um, the, they are orally available to some extent. We can get a small bump in 3HA, but um, they're they're not the best drugs from a pharmacokinetics okay. standpoint. So you saw lifespan extension, you saw consistent increases in 3HA, and then you tested direct supplementation with 3HA in mice. Yes. So take us through this experiment. Yeah, and this one we actually did first. So um, the, we I was already at the University of Arizona, um, but... Uh, like uh, the University of Washington, the Jackson Laboratory has a Nathan Shock Center, which we've talked about before. And uh, they, they helped us run a pilot study where um, we were able to add uh, uh, 3HA to the diet and uh, show that it was we were getting an increase in, in blood levels of 3HA. And we took some old mice. So in this, at this point, it was kind of uh, serendipitous. The, the uh, Jackson Laboratory had some old mice. These were very old, 28-month-old mice. Um, so you were saying 20 month old mice are kind of equivalent of 60 year old right. human, maybe roughly. Um, right. So these are much older than that, maybe 80 year old human or something right. like that. Um, and uh, again, this is a small study. This is like seven or eight mice, only males, um, seven or eight per 
treatment groups. So we but have you saw the same effect in both dose groups, right? So that that's gives right. A, again, this is a replication. I agree with you. I mean, you have to be very careful not to overinterpret yeah. small studies. That's right. But when you see two different doses that's right. giving the same effect in the same direction, at least gives you more confidence. That's right. Yeah, it otherwise. does. Yeah. And we've actually, so on the way um, out here to visit you, uh, I got the data from our validation study in this, and it looks like um, we got a male specific lifespan effect in that. So, and that hmm. has a few more mice in it. So we've actually now And validated. these were males? Uh, these were males. Um, and then the new okay. study was males and females. Huh. Um, so I, okay, let's, let's take just a moment. So we did see lifespan extension in this, in this, uh, this study, which was starting at 20, uh, 28 months of age. Um, and, uh, we, this is two doses. Um, I, I don't know if it, if it matters in this context, but like 300 parts per million, uh, was the low dose and 3000. How did you pick those million. doses? Um, we did a, a dosing study. Uh, so there, there's some history in the literature of dosing mice with 3HA in different contexts, not for aging. Okay. Um, so we had an idea of what blood levels you're able to get through and mostly they were done with injections or oral gavage. So you put, you basically put the, uh, put the 3HA in liquid and put it directly into the mouse's stomach. Um, and, uh, and so we had an idea of where to start and, uh, and we started with those, we did our own gavage study to uh, kind of nail down a rough dose. And then we converted that to kind of how much you'd need to give a mice mouse per day in their food to get a similar dose. Got it. And then we confirmed that we were getting a similar blood level. Got it. Um, so this looks like a pretty big effect. Uh, right? yep. I mean, it looks like I'm actually kind of now that I'm looking at the graph, wondering about the percentages, because yeah, I mean, it looks like the median survival from time of start, which is 28 months, right, right is about 10 weeks in the controls. Right. And it's like more than 30 weeks in the treated. Yeah. So, so the, the percentages are mean lifespan in this case, not median. Um, uh, okay. So that's part of, and these curves have a, a somewhat weird shape so that the median means are not going to be similar. I see. Yeah, because like for the maximum, there was one animal that lived yeah. a long time in the controls. Got this, it. Is, this is another okay. problem with small studies, yeah. right? So. I agree. Yes, that are important, but not earth shattering. Right. Yeah, we could get an even bigger effect by starting a little later, maybe, Probably. and having a yes. smaller absolute change in lifespan. Yeah. That's right. Um, so I think you could you could say if you wanted to, that you have the largest effect on remaining lifespan starting late in life. I better get out on social really, media and really start advertising. Yeah. I guess I don't have the right marketing <laughs> department. Okay, moving on. Uh, so, so it looks good. I mean, right, so you can do the genetic knockdown and increase lifespan. You can supplement directly with the metabolite that is increased by the genetic knockdown and increase lifespan. It sounds like you have now replicated this result, yeah. although with a an interesting twist that the effect seems to be male specific, which is not atypical That's for right. many small molecules that have been reported to extend lifespan. So let's zoom in on that. So that th this uh, replication study we've done, um, it started earlier. So this is starting at 20 months of age and it was at the same low dose that was in this paper. So when you say it's a smaller effect then, is it a smaller effect on absolute lifespan or a smaller relative effect compared to the controls? Um, I was literally processing this data in your office before we walked in here, okay, so, so I don't, don't know, know the, the answer, answer to that. Yeah. Um, but uh, so it, it might, it's probably, it may actually be a bigger absolute effect than okay. we saw in this study, um, probably similar to what we saw in the genetic study. Got it. And now remember in the genetic study, uh, we saw that the females were long lived and the males were were like borderline right. long lived. So, but that also could have been a power thing, right? Um, that that was probably partially a power thing, but it's interesting that the, the females were definitely longer lived than the males in that study. And in our, our most recent study, the females were not long lived at all, hmm. and the males were long lived. And that lived. was the supplementation study. And that was supplementation. So um, now if you look at the, the blood levels of 3HA in the diet study versus the genetic knockout study, they are um, off. The, the genetic knockout gives you something like a 50 fold higher dose in the blood. So there's some, there's definitely a dosing issue we need to work out and figure out where the optimal dose is for these things. And uh, in the genetic model, you have how missing in all the normal places it's being produced. So you're probably getting a different tissue distribution of 3HA than you would in the diet study. So there's some subtleties here that we don't understand yet. Yeah, cool. All right, so then you had just recently published a preprint uh, looking, mm -hmm. now we're back in C. elegans looking, this is now trying to sort of uncover some of the mechanisms here. So maybe take yep. us through the take-homes from this study. 
Okay, yeah, so this is the paper looking at immune function. So be, because we, we have this history of 3HA, or not 3HA, but the kinurenin pathway broadly, and a little bit of data on 3HA in kind of the context of inflammation and immune function, um, we, we wanted to ask if, uh, if one of the things that it was doing in this case was um, improving the ability of the worm to deal with um, bacterial pathogens. And uh, there's the, so worms eat bacteria, that's their food source. And in the lab, uh, we feed them E. coli. Uh, and that E. coli is already slightly pathogenic, um, but then we wanted to test a, uh, a more severe pathogen, so we used Pseudomonas arginosa, right. um, P the PA14 strain, which is one of the kind of gold standard strains for doing uh, pathogenic work in bacteria. And uh, it turns out that uh, the worm, the how knockout worms, um, it, a young animal that is exposed to Pseudomonas arginosa is short-lived, and the how worms are about shortened, their lifespan is shortened about the same, but Later in life, the worms become more sensitive to the Pseudomonas bacteria, and the how worms maintain their resistance to that bacteria better later in life. So the speculation here would be that um, there's a decline in immune function with age, and that maybe that decline is at least partially driven by a, a deficiency of 3HA. And you're um, kind of restoring that? Uh, perhaps. Um, uh, that, that is one potential interpretation. Have you looked at 3 I guess it's hard because it's so low. I was going to ask if you looked at how 3HA levels change with age. Right. Um, yeah, they, they don't really. They're just always low. Um, and that's also true in humans. Um, so that, that could be the case, especially since in all of these cases, we've looked either in whole worms or in human blood. Um, uh, so if this was doing something with bacterial immunity, you'd expect a local increase in 3HA in like macrophages or an immune cell would be beneficial, maybe the yeah. gut tissue. Yeah. And we haven't looked there. So it's possible that a local change in 3HA is, is you know, partially responsible for immune decline with age. Um, it's also possible that you don't normally have 3HA, but adding it to the system in, enhances something. the immune yeah. system beyond what you normally have. Yeah. Although, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier, there is this connection between um, at least cancer sort of hijacking the normal immune surveillance by pushing flux through this pathway, right? That's right. And so I guess one possibility would be that, that if you add 3HA, you are going to feed back up the pathway and restore tryptophan levels? Is that possible? Um, it's, it's possible. So we've looked at this in worms, um, in the how knockout worms. Um, so they have very high levels of 3HA. You do see a little bit of that effect where that you see a slight increase in each of the upstream metabolites, um, but it's, it's a, a very small effect. Okay. So I, I, I suspect that the effect size there is, is small enough that it's, it's not what's happening, but it's possible. All right, we'll put that in the speculation bin for now. That's right. All right, so the key question is, even though it's not available on Amazon, do you take 3HA? Uh, definitely not. <laughs> we are way too early for that. Um, there is a, and actually there's a problem if we were trying to get this FDA approved that might also give you pause for uh, taking 3HA yourself. One of the earliest studies of this molecule um, was a uh, identified a pro-cancer effect of 3HA. Oh, really? Huh. Um, now, uh, the whether it's, Physiologically relevant is an important this question. This is in mice? This is in rats. In rats. And what they did was they took a solid bolus of 3HA, so a pellet, and surgically implanted it into the bladder. And uh, it they saw an increase in bladder cancer. Why, why would you do that experiment? Uh, I, apparently that was a common way to do kind of a carcinogen testing in back in huh. the, the 60s and 70s. Okay. Um, and there's a whole set of papers that do this for across a bunch of compounds. Um, but what you're doing there is you're basically driving 3HA to its maximum dose in the bladder. Um, and we've done some calculations to try to figure out where our dose is compared to this dose. And they're probably like an order of magnitude higher. Yeah, that seems not. very non-physiological. That, that's so hard to that's interpret. my interpretation. And given that we see um, for longevity effects, we're probably not giving these mice cancer. Right. Um, so right. Um, uh, my suspicion is that was a technical... Uh, uh, detail about those the way they were doing those yeah. cancer studies. So, um, but still, I'm I'm I, this is very early work. Um, we're we're just we've done our first preclinical trials. There is no human testing on this. I uh, I do not recommend taking three HA, and I'm certainly not taking it myself. All right, very good. So, let's pivot then and talk about what you are doing. So, what what you've had sort of a personal health journey in the last few years, and maybe sure. you can share with us kind of your thoughts on on approaches to health what you do, what you wish you did. 
Right. I, yeah. So my, I think from what you've said, I think my health journey, like getting seriously into it, probably started uh, in the same last couple of years, the same way you, that yeah. you've done it. Um, and I, I've always been kind of relatively healthy. I like to hike and going out, and I maintained a, a reasonably healthy body weight. It's often, sometimes higher than I would like, but um, I generally eat pretty healthy. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm in this field and uh, maybe I went through the same transition that you did where it's like, OK, we've we know something about what we can do. Um, maybe I should start applying it to myself. Um, and uh, I think uh, my approach has been somewhat uh, similar to the way OptiSpan approaches it, where you I know that one there aren't any one size fits all solutions. Um, and so I try to uh, I've started seeing a, a doctor that's willing to do a lot of blood work and measure a lot of things. So I, I have specific targets that I'm going for in terms of cholesterol in my blood or, um, you know, you've, you've mentioned uh, testosterone and hormones, so hormone levels uh, and kind of there's a whole panel of things that we look at. I get regular blood draws and we try to be very targeted on supplementation or drug approaches to modify these things. How hard was it for you to find a doctor that you felt you could take this sort of an approach with? Um, in the primary care system, I nearly impossible. I don't, I don't know that there there probably are doctors out there that do that. Um, but most oftentimes, the the primary care system is so corporatized these days that they you know you spend ten minutes with your doctor, right. and you go down your checklist, and you're done, and right. they have to get on to the next patient. Um, but there's a, a an emerging kind of a functional healthcare network out there where these doctors you pay a little extra. Um, and they are, you know, I, I, every month I've probably talked to the, the, my doctor for an hour and we talk through all the details of the blood work and what how frequently are you getting the blood work done? Um, at first I was, I was actually doing it monthly, which is probably too often. Um, but, uh, uh, now I'm doing it quarterly Yeah, about, that so. seems like about the right cadence to me. As yeah. Well. So in the beginning we, you know, it, I hadn't done a lot of this before. So we were, we were trying to adjust some things and try to see what, what was my normal and, uh, and then develop strategies. Did you get any surprises when you um, first started doing your blood work? Nothing, uh, nothing major. Um, I, you know, you get blood pressure done. So like my, my blood pressure has always been like dead on 120 over 80. Um, my cholesterol is a little high, um, uh, you know, low, low in testosterone a little bit, but everything was like, you know, within, within a normal range, maybe a standard deviation off. So no major changes. Um, but, uh, there are certain certainly goals. So uh, you, you're probably appreciate that the the reference ranges for a lot of these molecules, the healthy state that the doctors use are are normal, but not necessarily optimal. Right. And so things like LDL cholesterol and ApoB, you want to drive the uh, my goal. Personal goal is to have those a lot lower than the average. Right. And so um, this gives us a, a tool for measuring the. Yeah, I mean, I think the same thing's true with a lot of the the vitamins, right? The the normal range is really right. suboptimal for many people, right? right? So, yeah, I think that's a, a unfortunate aspect of the current healthcare, yeah, sort of environment. Yeah. So, so what what do I do? So the 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 big approaches are uh, are you know very similar to what we've talked about here before. Yeah, get exercise. I'm much more deliberate about what types of exercise I'm getting and and. Um, I've been trying, my strategy for exercise has been to build it into my lifestyle. So mm -hmm. um, I bike commute and that gives me kind of the nice long zone two training uh, every week. And uh, I've started rock climbing with my kid and uh, we, so we go to the gym and that gives us something cool. like resistance training and I yeah. kind of add on to that. Do you do any dedicated resistance training? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, I maybe because that one is not built into my lifestyle currently, um, I, I do do it, but it's not, I haven't got it quite habitual yet. So yeah. um, we, I've been adding the kind of big, you know, bench press and uh, squats it's and compound deadlifts. Movements. And yeah, and like I think the word you use there is really important, habitual, right? I think making these sorts of positive uh, lifestyle choices, habits is a big part of the success equation. So I've I've on and off done resistance training my whole life, but it's never in uh, different times I've been more or less active. Have you had a DEXA body composition? I did my first DEXA about a year ago. I've got my next one scheduled in about a month. Cool. Um, so that that's been a major focus. Um, uh, so when I started this process, I was kind of on the heavier side of where I wanted to be, maybe like two twenty, two twenty five. 
um, and I've I've been losing weight, uh, so I'm down to about 200. And uh, my goal has been to lose the lose weight without losing body uh, lean, lean mass. mass, right? Yeah. And that's challenging. Yeah. Um, I you know that I used to do kind of the intermittent fasting on and off at different times. Um, I know you're not a fan <laughs> of that, and I've you know I've kind of come around. I, I naturally fast because I don't really eat breakfast, yeah. and that's my natural eating state. Um, but I've got I've kind of developed the same kind of concerns about like okay you lose weight but do you lose the the fat? Yeah, and I, I would say I mean I think intermittent fasting works for some people, and, it and there are ways does. to do it without sacrificing lean mass. But there you are. have to I mean anytime you're in a calorie deficit. Yep. You need to take steps to minimize loss of lean mass, right? And yeah, that's the steps absolutely. that I would suggest make the most sense are probably eating more protein and yep. doing resistance training, yep. right? Um, so whether it's intermittent fasting or other forms of calorie restriction, and this is the thing that I don't like about intermittent fasting is it, it sort of gets you know presented as if it's something different from caloric restriction. I yep. think if you are achieving caloric restriction by intermittent fasting, great if that works for you and you want to lose weight, you still need should take steps to minimize lean mass loss. If you are doing intermittent fasting and not achieving caloric restriction, I don't think there's any benefit at all. And there might be some harm. Right. So. And yeah, so I, when I was doing this, it does work for losing weight. I'll absolutely say that. I also did ketogenic diet for a while. That works very well. Um, but at this point, I I had not done a DEXA. I don't know what my numbers were. Right. So I, sure. I was yeah. almost Lack certainly losing <laughs> yeah, lean mass. Um, so I've got a baseline now for what my lean mass was when I started and what my fat mass was, and, uh, we'll see what happens in a month. So I've, I've been following a high protein diet. Um, and, uh, and what I, do you mean by high protein? Yeah, that's a good question. So when I, I was aiming for about a, a gram per, per pound of body weight, yeah. um, I find that challenging and I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. So I'd say I would consist, I consistently probably get 120 to 150, but I'm, I weigh 195 right now. So I would need to get that higher into the right. 180 to 200 right. range. And I do find that challenging. Do you do like protein shakes or anything? Yeah. So I do, I do a protein shake, uh, kind of whey isolate based protein, um, protein. Uh, I, I don't do a lot of protein bars, but that's like a way to supplement. Yeah. I kind of cut the protein bars out. Yeah. Of you mine. talked about that. <laughs> so, so how are you uh, achieving your protein goals? At yeah. This I eat a lot so. of chicken. I like chicken, yeah. which is good. I, I eat, uh, sort of low fat, low sugar yogurt that's pretty high in protein. So okay. there's some yep. yogurts out there that can get up to like, you know, 10 grams of protein in 50 calories or 12 or 15 grams in 80 calories. So, um, you know, the problem, potential problem with those, they've got artificial sweeteners, but I still kind of, you know, there's no perfect way, I think, to get to get your protein up to that level if that's what you're going for. I don't typically get that high on a, on a, daily basis. But I think if, again, again, not, not one size fits all, but I think in general, if you are losing weight and you want to preserve lean mass, getting about one gram per pound of body weight and doing resistance training is probably the best way to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't think I've talked about it here, but I did post, uh, on X, you know, my first two DEXs where I went from, I think 195 pounds and 21% body fat to 185 pounds and like 14 and a half, yep. but actually gained lean mass. So at the same time I lost 10 pounds or 15 pounds of fat, I actually gained five pounds of lean mass. Right. And the things that I did were what we just talked about. I bumped up my protein to about one gram per pound of body weight. I did resistance training. I, I also took creatine and I stopped drinking alcohol. That's yeah. about it, right? Yeah. So it's one of those things and probably the combination of all of them. Sure, it's a combination. Yeah, and I, I mean, alcohol certainly feeds into this. Yeah. The way it alters your liver function. It has its and own hormones. hormones and hormones. Um, yeah, and so I, 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 for the past several years, we've we've just taken one dry month a year, just uh, kind of a way to reset and see if, we, if it affects yeah. things. And I'm actually right at the end of that now. Uh, for this year. So we'll see. I we'll see if that affects anything with the, the DEXA coming up, maybe. So cool. So what about supplements? Anything? Uh yeah. So I, I maybe I'm a little less conservative than you and what you've talked about. So I, I probably take a few more. Um the the one thing that you have not mentioned um on the podcast yet, as far as I know, that has had the biggest effect for me was a um a combination of pre and probiotics. Mm, yeah. Um so uh, I and I I there's this is an area I'm, I'm interested in uh, scientifically, but also um, from a from kind of an anecdotal personal experience. 
Um, I, I tried them on and off, and I think it's there's a, a high degree of variability in quality um, Absolutely. In, in, pro, yeah. in probiotics, and I, I found one that at least for me has a, a positive effect, and I, no, I notice it in the way I feel. You want to share? Um, I'd have to go and, and find the brand. Okay, name. well, we'll, we'll see if we head. can put that on the in sure. the show notes. Yeah. So what about prebiotics? Because you're right, I haven't talked about it, but that I think is really interesting, and I do do some of this as well. So I'm interested yeah, to hear. Um, so oh, you've mentioned fiber before and yeah, so, yeah. so I take like xylem fus uh, husk yeah. and I, and then there's a, um, a soluble fiber, um, that, called sun fiber that I use that comes from guar beans, I think, okay. um, which, uh, yeah. the problem with most soluble fibers is they're not very soluble. Um, <laughs> and, but this one actually can, you so you can put it in a protein shake yeah. or even a glass of water and it just kind of dissolves. Yeah. That's what I do. So I put, I put chia seeds and, uh, inulin powder for soluble fibers and inulin powder that okay. actually works really well. You can put that right in your shake and it, Okay. Yeah, inulin is pretty good. The um, in, you know, I I don't know how much we we know about this, or even the the field knows, but like different forms of fiber probably affect different bacteria, sub types of bacteria. I, I'm sure they do. And there's yeah. yeah, and I mean the thing is, you can if you go if you go on the internet, right? You put anything yeah. in, you're gonna find people who say, oh yeah, it's great, it cures everything, it reverses aging, blah blah blah. And they find other people, oh, it causes cancer, it's terrible. You kind of have to navigate that so that's right you know i've kind of i've kind of done my navigation and i feel pretty confident that these things are not going to cause a problem right and uh and they work for me so so yeah so this is actually how do you approach supplements right so the, my my approach is I, I i try to do some research and as long as it's not clearly harmful i will i'll usually try it but i want to have a, a metric that i'm trying to improve right so either kind of quality of how I feel yeah. it could be subjective um, or maybe there's a blood marker I'm trying to, to affect. And so I will add something for a couple of months and see if it, if I can see a noticeable effect. And if I don't, I'm not going to spend money on it. And if I do, then uh, I will usually add that to my routine. Cool. Um, so I'm taking creatine. Um, I do the, I do a, a protein shake, um, probably not every day, but I try to do it on days where I'm doing resistance training at least. Um, what else is in the, in the mix? Um, um, I got fiber. Oh, uh, you see, if you can't remember the supplements you're taking, that means you take a, need to take a sup. either taking too many or, or you need, need to take one for memory. For a memory <laughs> supplement. Yes, that's right. So maybe I need to add one of those. Do you have a recommendation? No. <laughs> uh, but D3 and, uh, yeah. and fish oil. So, yeah. um, so you've, you've mentioned the omega index and this was a question I've, I've had a hard time finding a, a test for that. That's, that's rival. Ah, like LabCorp didn't. Both of them don't, they won't tell it to you, but if you take the DHA and the EPA and you add them together, that's the omega index. Okay. So it's and, not, it's but, nothing uh, magical. Okay. And well, I but think, those are measured on, uh, I, I couldn't find a test at LabCorp at least that was current on their current list that was measuring those. Uh, I don't know. They both do it. I don't remember. One of them, they call it Omega Check. Okay. Uh, I don't but, remember whether that's LabCorp or Quest. Okay. Um, but they both, they both measure it and they will give you, they'll give it back to you in slightly different ways. Right. But if you, they'll all, they'll all do the DHA and the EPA, and then you can just calculate the. Yeah. So index. just getting those two measurements. So, yeah. um, okay. So that, uh, that one is one I've been needing a metric for, but I, I, I'm convinced that it's important. I just don't know what my numbers are. Yeah. Yet. And again, that's another one where, you know, you get all sorts of opinions out there on yeah. what you should shoot for. And I, I don't know what the right answer is. I, I don't know if anybody does, but sort of where I've landed is, you know, if you look look at the epidemiology, it seems um, pretty reasonable to me that try to get, if you get, so that I think the average American omega index is really low. It's like less than three, maybe. Um, but if you look across different countries, there are countries where it's as high as eight or 10. And if you look at the epidemiology, that seems to be about the sweet spot for right. reducing risk of all the things that being low in omega threes is associated with. Now, does that prove causality? No, of course it doesn't prove causality. But there's a pretty good. It's kind of like vitamin D. You'll get these blowhards out there who argue that oh, there's no proof vitamin D is important for anything. And I'm like, come on. <laughs> so you know, I mean, yes, proving causality, doing a clinical trial, demonstrating that omega-3 or vitamin D or B12 or whatever right. is causally involved in all of these things that it's causally involved in or they are causally involved in. Proving that is very challenging. But at some point, you have to like, you know, let the overwhelming amount of evidence guide That's what right. you do. And what is the freaking downside to fixing these things? This, right. is what I, this, is, this is what bothers me about the reactive disease care industry. It's like Absolutely. they will push back 
in such ridiculous ways about actually fixing problems. And it's like, just fix the goddamn problem. You know? So anyways. <laughs> yeah. And then you get the complications that even if you have these clinical trials, that that gives you an answer across a, a, a broad spectrum. And of almost people. always those clinical trials are underpowered. That, well, they're underpowered. So, so, yeah. and, and how it's going to affect the average uh, movement or, or effect in a population is not the same as how it's going yeah. to affect you. And you have True. to, so you, you want to, in, you, you can either wait for those or in some of these cases where there's a, a decent amount of evidence, you can then try it for yourself. I think that's the challenge is when does yeah. it, and this is going to be an individual choice, but when does it get, when does that's the right. burden of evidence get to the point where you make the analysis that, you know, this makes sense to do and, and that that's complicated. That That's um, absolutely complicated. And this is where having a, a good uh, medical provider who's willing right. to talk through these things with you and knows yeah. something about the literature. Is yeah, important. which is really tough. Um, so I know two people recently, both of them are, you know, older women. So in their 70s, probably, who found out from a test that they were deficient in either vitamin D in one case or omega-3 in another. And they didn't get that test done through their primary care doc. Right. They went to their primary care doc and told them, showed them the results and said, I am deficient. What do you recommend? And in both cases, the doc was like, oh, don't worry about it. Yeah. And I'm like, I, and I don't know what that means. Is that because the doctor, well, actually in one case, this I think was the omega-3, the doctor said, well, it's controversial whether that's important. Like, is it really? <laughs> but, but I think, and I don't, I haven't, I, I don't know whether that's because the doctors really believe that it's not important or are they being, like if it was a, and I'm just speculating, I don't know, but if it was a, 30 year old woman, would their answer have been different, right? Do they yeah. view people in their 60s, 70s, 80s differently in terms of preventative, proactive approaches than they do people who are younger? Like, I don't know. Yeah. But to me, that is just, there's no excuse as, an, as, a, as a medical provider to have that reaction when one of your patients presents you with quantitative evidence that they are deficient in an That's important right. nutrient. And there's this this bias, cultural bias, probably that uh, if something's going wrong when you're older, oh, that's just normal yeah, right. aging. Exactly. That's natural. Yeah. So, and I think there's, I, I've heard that from doctors, and uh, uh, and maybe that's just kind of gone all the way through to the medical. So this profession. is a big part, obviously, of what we're working on is trying to yeah. change minds, change mindsets, both for individuals and for medical providers to a more proactive approach. Okay, so anything else you do that you wanna share that you think is um, interesting, important, random? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of other that are more targeted to like work on testosterone levels or something like that. Um, I, I, I am taking rapamycin, so I've, I've uh, taken- I, I, Okay, so now that you that. said that everybody's gonna to wanna to know, What's your protocol? How right. much are you taking? So at the moment, I'm doing the the most common, which is the six milligrams once a week, um, and uh, the I, I have had a couple of the most common side effect, which is the mouth sores. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my I, I've I've had an, had actually an interesting experience with this. Um, I, I I had a couple where it's just like a small little ache around one of my tooth or something like that, and then it goes away after a couple of days. Hmm. But um, I don't eat a lot of candy, but my son had some Sour Patch Kids, and uh, we were watching a movie, and I, I used to love these things when I was a kid. So I was like, what the hell? You know, <laughs> I'm going to have some of these. Um, but, you know, sour candies and citrus can, like, uh, yeah, kind of make yeah. your uh, tear apart your mouth a little bit. And that happened. Um, and usually that'll go away after a day or two. Um, but it was much worse than I've, I've ever had it before, and it lasted like a week and a half. So it was exacerbated. Yeah, and so, I, and Interesting. so, of course, I... I Maybe it's it's a speculation, but right. it looks it, you know maybe there's something yeah. there. So I, I wonder if rapamycin is not necessarily causing these side effects, but just like if you get a little uh, ding on your mouth, it's like exacerbating. That seems that seems likely to me actually. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Yeah, so I'm currently on a cycle of rapamycin, which I'm doing twelve weeks right now at eight migs a week, and also recently had a mouth sore. But I I would every once in a while get these things you know, maybe like once a year. And so again, it's always hard. Like, yeah. is that, was that the rapamycin? Was it just going to happen? I, Who knows? Right? I, I agree. Yeah. So I, I, we don't know if these things are being. Caused. So are you doing it continuously then? Like, um, so I, I, I haven't really, um, figured this part out yet. I'm, I, how long I'm going to do it. So I, I've got a, an eye, um, procedure coming up and I'm going to go off of it for uh -huh. that. Yeah. And then I'll probably pick it back up. And I was thinking, I was considering trying a, a, a higher dose going up to eight or 10 maybe. Okay. Um, but how long have you been doing it? 
Uh, probably about, uh, let's see, four or five months, I okay. think now. So, um, so uh, at this point, I am doing it continuously, and there's just a natural break coming up in a couple weeks when I'm going to have this eye thing done. Right. Okay. Um, and then, uh, but so this is one where um, maybe we don't have clear metrics. I measure uh, my blood levels, uh, and I'm kind of hitting that. Uh, what what at least in the literature seems like the the expected range so the mid teens for uh, is it micro is it micrograms per mil is that the met metric nanograms or nanograms per mil yeah, yeah. nanograms um, I, I, yeah so I'm I'm in that that's that same range um, so I'm and that's kind of how long after dosing uh, that is at peak so two okay. hours after the Got dose um, I have not measured my tail dose yet so that's yeah. something I want we're to actually going to do that hopefully next week is um, we'll do a baseline on me uh, a week out. Right. Yep. So right before I do my weekly dosing yes. and yep. then two hours and then four hours and probably eight hours. And right. See what we see. Yeah. So um, this is kind of a, one of those places. So we talk about what is the metric that we're trying to improve in this case. And um, one of these long, something like rapamycin where you're going for these long term health issues. Um, it's not clear to me that you expect a short term benefit necessarily if the goal is to maintain health. And so I, I I'd like to I want to hear what you're thinking on this. I think it depends on the person, right? Yeah. So I, I, I um, like my own personal case with my frozen shoulder, right. I knew right away, right? So in that case, I think if you have a profound chronic inflammatory condition that is affecting your quality of life in some you know, very clear way, rapamycin might have a very big impact that would be noticeable in that context. Yeah. And this is sort of my anecdotal perception from talking to lots of people is the people who take it and feel better in some profound way, it's because they had a high level of chronic inflammation that was making them feel crappy, right? right. Um, but if you don't have that, then yeah, I don't know that you would expect to, to feel anything. And obviously we don't know what the long-term benefits or negative effects right. are, right? So, so the, Yeah, so this is a case where if you're going for like long-term maintenance of health and you think it's gonna affect that, we may not expect a change in the short term and that right. may be okay. Right, have you, uh, gotten your hormones measured since you've been on rapamycin? I, uh, I think there's this question of, you know, some people ask, will we expect it to reduce testosterone? I don't know of any evidence to support that. In people who have low testosterone, might it increase testosterone? Maybe? I, I don't know. So I, I have been measuring it, um, but we've also been doing, doing other, other interventions. Yeah. So um, I don't I, I don't have a clear answer okay. whether it looks like it's doing anything. It's yeah. possible. Um, but I, I'm a little low on testosterone. And, and are you measuring free testosterone? Uh, yes. And I think I'm measuring it a couple of different ways. And are you that. measuring, um, sort of the related hormones, sex hormone binding globulin, FSH, LH? Uh, some of them. I, we're definitely measuring the estrogens. I don't think we're measuring all of those. Um, okay. and so with me, so testosterone can be turned into estrogens and estradiol and my body apparently likes to do really that. Really good at that. So I, I'm also taking, uh, trying to there's inhibitors of the aromatases that do this process. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Peter Atia has got a bunch of really good episodes on this stuff. Yeah, I don't know right. if you've watched them, but I, I've, um, I've listened to most of them. Yes. Yeah. So I, you know, he he certainly has gone way deeper than I'm willing or capable of going right now. But right. Um, <laughs> and I know I know you've talked about doing an episode on this stuff, and and um, I'm I'm a little low on one, a little high on the other, and so we're I, we're just trying to do subtle things to try to bump it back up into good the range got it. that we're going for. Yep. Got it. Okay. Anything else? Um, I think that mostly covers what I'm doing right now. Excellent. Yeah. All right. You are doing CGM, right? So uh, I want to talk I've about your, on right your, now. your yes, personal uh, CG, continuous yes. glucose monitoring experiment. Absolutely, so yeah. um, why don't you tell me what you did and why you did it? <laughs> Yeah, I, so through Peter Tia's podcast, and uh, now you, you've talked about it. Uh, uh, and this was in the this was in the podcast I recorded with Kevin White, right? Uh, yes, that I think that's right. Yeah. Thing. So, um, so uh, one of the major kind of classes of age associated disease or metabolic diseases like diabetes. And uh, I have diabetes in my family. Um, I have a brother who is type one diabetic. Uh, my mom is late onset type one, and I've uh, we've also got type two in the family. So, and what is your glucose. like fasting glucose and A one C look like? Yeah, so um, my normal is uh, so I, I I have a morning effect like you do. Yeah. Um, so I think when I'm asleep, my typical is like in the eighties. And then I wake up and I jump up into like the 115 range. Yeah, I know, right? right? Just now. in time for the fasting glucose exactly, test. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> uh, so when I try to do the fasting glucose, I try to wait to the end of that. I, I've tried it both ways. I don't know. But uh, but anyway, I have a history where I, I want to know if I'm, you know, at risk for diabetes and where I am on the on the chart. So it seems like I'm doing very well. Like my, my blood glucose is just fine. Um, 
And, uh, and you by that you mean when you've monitored it with a continuous glucose monitor continuous over glucose like monitor. several days, right? And yeah. yeah, so previously, and I think because of this morning effect, when I got the spot measurements, I it would be all over the board, right? right. Highly variable, and so that was one impetus for doing the continuous monitoring. Right. Um, and so I've been using um, the Libre uh, three, yeah. which is uh, one of the the most recent Libre version, and that's that's worked very well. Um, and, uh, I think I've done a total of six weeks, just, uh, uh, the, the, this particular one lasts 14 days. So you yep. do it in two week chunks. Um, uh, and except where I run into a, the, uh, a chair or something and tear the thing off my arm, which has happened two or three times. Um, <laughs> you run into chairs with your arm a lot. <laughs> well, I know it's like getting you, you're sitting down at the desk yeah. and you get up and you move over there. And you know, you apparently you can put them right here. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I wasn't, yeah. I, I've, I've tried to You'll look, look that up. very cool. Yeah. Like right on the side of your neck. No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Um, I've looked up it, whether it's accurate if you put it somewhere else, and I wasn't sure. So um, I know some people have yeah, the monitors that you wear on your yeah. abdomen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I've done this a few times, um, and uh, I, I've you know you hear anecdotes, and you've talked about your experience with the bagel, right? So yes. Um, but I've not found the food that uh, that peaks my interesting. Thing. So I've huh. I've uh, done a bunch of things, fruit and bread and things like I that. I wonder if that's microbiome related. Like maybe that's that probiotic you're taking. It could be, yeah. So um, interesting. Probiotics <laughs> can certainly affect the insulin signaling system and the the um, GLP one system, uh, where these like semaglutide and these like the modern weight loss drugs that yeah. um, are are modifying this system. Um, Bacteria are known to influence that system. So there's right. certainly some interaction there. Huh. Um, so I think uh, outside of the glucose tolerance test, which I'll, we'll talk about next, um, I think the highest I've ever, I, I don't think I've ever peaked 150 hmm. um, after a normal meal or something yeah. like that. Um, so uh, so reassuring, given that you right. went in, you know, thinking pre-diabetes, diabetes, diabetes right. runs in the family. Yeah. So that's good. So uh, it doesn't seem to be a problem for me at the moment. So that's good. Um, and then, uh, of course, if you want to test this more thoroughly, you do a glucose tolerance test. Um, so I had done this um, uh, on my own where you can buy from Amazon just a pack of glucose um, there uh, for the pre uh, for the, the pregnant women is usually where they're yeah, used. gestational, gestational diabetes. diabetes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I bought one of these things. It was 75 grams of glucose. Right. And, this is glucola, right? Uh, right. It's essentially glucola. You mix it yourself. Yeah. And so so again, just for anybody who's not familiar with this, this is the equivalent of if you were to go to a doctor, get yep. an oral glucose tolerance test. This is commonly done for gestational diabetes, right? Also done sometimes to test for diabetes. And so what you do is you drink a sugar drink with a specific amount of glucose, yep. 75 grams usually. Right. And then what they do is they'll measure your blood glucose and blood insulin levels at baseline before you drink. Yep. And then I think it's usually every half hour for two or three hours. Yeah, I think you get a 15 minute to 30 minute and then every half hour okay. after that. Yeah. And then based on your two hour glucose levels, that's kind of the first thing that they use to put you in a bucket for pre-diabetes, diabetes. But then you can get more information by looking at the earlier glucose time points and the way insulin tracks with glucose to kind of further refine what's happening from a right so you can level. look at how long it takes you to hit peak and like what your peak level is and then whether right. you actually come down to baseline right. but the idea is that by giving a straight sugar drink you're sort of bypassing some of the digestion microbiome potential effects that are that could be different from person to person yeah that's right and you t you kind of chug this thing in like five minutes or, okay. or something like that. okay so you're wearing a cgm yeah. wearing a you cgm drink this sugar drink and yep. what happens um i i got all the way up to the high peak of 105 desolated so right. that's nothing right so yeah. I, I barely peaked so i don't know what happened in this case but i did not get a normal glucose okay, response that's on the graphic here so yeah, we'll so show the graphic the, here of george's oral glucose tolerance yeah, so, so this is in the, the red orange line. line yeah the orange to the red line um so right. okay. basically it went up a little bit but this is not what you normally expect from one of these tests right um so then i was listening to the uh, you had reached out to me and said you started a podcast so i was listening to the optus fan podcast and you mentioned your jelly bean challenge um, which I'd never heard of before. Um, but the, that pack of 75 grams of glucose is probably 20 bucks. And, you know, a pack of jelly beans is <laughs> a lot less. $1.50 or something. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I was on board with trying this and I was like, okay, let's give it a try. So I, I had um, another, I put one of the glucose monitors on um, and uh, we were actually at Disneyland uh, this last weekend. And so when we were in the morning standing in line waiting in there, I was just like sitting there chugging like the jelly beans. Um, 
And uh, not the perfectly controlled experiment. It's not perfectly but controlled, okay. but uh, <laughs> I was fasted and yeah. uh, you know walking around. So there's some things that can affect this thing. Um, but uh, and uh, I'm, just for full disclosure, I was using a different brand. It wasn't the Brock's Jelly Beans. Right. I was using Jelly Bellies, which are smaller. And you have to. I was trying deviating to deviating from the protocol I was already. Devi well, deviating from your protocol, yes. So, <laughs> but I was trying to match my glucose um, thing. So I, I ate the equivalent of 75 grams of, of sugar. Right. right? Uh, so it's I think 73 these jelly beans. God. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're smaller, but that's a lot of jelly beans, right? So um, they were medicinal jelly beans. Right? Um, and uh, in this case, I got this beautiful, um, you know, yeah. glucose response. Looks like spirit, a classic so. uh, glucose spike. Right. And uh, not quite it, as nice as mine. I think mine. One of the times I actually got above two hundred. Believe it. But were you walking around? No, I was. I was yes, sitting there yeah, watching so, football. So you did it. It was properly, a Sunday morning. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, it depends on what was happening in the game. I <laughs> that's guess, right. But, um, but yeah, the, these are nice. You know, fairly nicely superimposed. So you've done this three times. Yeah, I did this three days in a row. And uh, always at Disneyland. Uh, I think, yeah, two of the days where one of them was in the car. <laughs> okay. so. Now, so here's the question, though. Was your first time with the Glucola with a different device? Um, it was, yeah, so it was not the same sensor, but it was right. the same okay. brand. So of, it's always yeah. possible there was something weird going on it, with that sensor. That, yeah, so that, that's what I suspect is there was something weird with that sensor. Okay. Um, I, uh, and it's, I, I haven't done it because it's the glucose pack is expensive. Right. So. Um, and and so yeah, so this this is this is kind of matches up with my experience doing this as well. That you yeah. get this nice spike. The cool thing is how replicable it is from right. day to day. Like I did mine a week apart, and the curves were almost on top of each other. Yeah. So yeah, it's pretty consistent. It looks good, right? So if this was an oral glucose tolerance test, we don't have insulin, obviously. But right. you go out to the two hour time point, 120 minutes, you're back down to baseline. Boom, you're in good shape. Yeah. Right? Um, and I, one other thing I was wondering if, if there might have been something here. So the, the glucose, uh, the powder was pure glucose. And the jelly beans have a mix of probably sucrose and fructose and some other things. Yeah. And glucose isn't normally the sugar we experience in our day-to-day -day lives. So right. I was wondering if there might be, uh, the, the jelly beans might actually be maybe better in some I don't some know. Ways. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. I It would be interesting to do a, another direct comparison, you know, with the same device trying to match up the exact amount of sugar uh, between the glucola and the jelly beans and see. I suspect yeah. there was something weird that I, happened. I, I suspect that too. And this, and obviously I don't have replicate and then we right. didn't do another sensor. Right. So uh, we, what you want to do is get the same sensor and do these day to day with different sources. But what we can say is the jelly bean challenge was a success. That's for right. You. Yeah. So okay. good deal. All right. So let's switch gears. Yep. Uh, I want to talk briefly about the American Aging Association. Yeah. So you are currently the chair of the American Aging Association. You've been involved with age for a long time. Um, as you know, I spent a lot of time in leadership at age, first as president, then as the chair. Right, now so, I took over from you. So that's right, so you, and, and you, you inherited the throne, so to speak. Um, congratulations, by the way. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so maybe just wanted to give you a chance to talk about the American Aging Association, what it's all about, what it does for the field, and then a little bit about the upcoming scientific meeting. Yeah, so the American Aging Association is a scientific society, So, uh, and we are focused on uh, primarily uh, the, more on the basic side of aging, so the, the science of aging. So right. there's, uh, there's other societies like the Gerontological Society, which, uh, society of America, which kind of does more of the clinical translational work. Right. Um, and American Aging Association does do some of that too, and we do have kind of people there who I do. I think the way I would frame it is American Aging Association is more focused on the biological yeah, the mechanisms biology of, of aging, aging, whereas Gerontological Society of America is more broad, right? So that yeah. includes social aspects of aging. There's a big nursing component. So there's a geriatrics component, that's right? right? Yeah. So it's, it's but it all, GSA also has a biological sciences yeah. group, but that's just a small part of a much larger organization. And there's a lot of overlap in who is members of these right. committees. So, uh, so these are, um, the, the bulk of the membership are working scientists, uh, professors, students uh, in, in who are working on the biology of aging. Uh, and we have an annual meeting where we get together and we share our science and we form collaborations. And, uh, and, uh, and we also have a training mission. So we one of our big strengths and I know you you during your tenure, you, you had a big part in supporting this was the our, we have a trainee chapter right. where graduate students and uh, undergraduate students and postdocs can come in and have a, a community where they can get resources and they get travel grants to, to go to meetings um, okay. and work, um, working on some ways to do a little bit of research support maybe. Uh, and uh, and they are 
some of the most active members of our society and that really driving the energy of the field. Yeah, I mean, I think the trainee chapter is a huge strength of American Aging Association. Yep. And, you know, I think it, that that's one of the things that I've been most excited and enthusiastic about is to see the growth and energy um, of that group of people who are going to be the future of this field. So, right. And there's also a, a, a public outreach mission so that we're, the goal is for the American Aging Association to be a source of accurate information on the science of aging for um, scientists, for sure, but also clinicians and yeah. the general public. Yeah, I mean, that is in the mission, right, is yeah. to inform uh, the medical community and to engage with yeah. clinicians. And that is a place where I think the society um, can expand. Absolutely. Uh, uh, but you, you do get some physicians attending the meeting. And in fact, if anybody is a medical practitioner interested in, maybe we'll call it health span medicine, I don't really like the term longevity medicine because it's been co-opted by some charlatans, but I think health span medicine maybe is a way to say it. Um, or in just interested in the biology of aging and how that intersects with health. I think age is a great meeting to come and, you know, learn about some of the science, meet people. That's actually where I met Kevin White the first time was oh, at yeah, one of the American right. Aging Association yep. meetings. So, yeah. Um, so certainly would encourage people to attend the meeting. So the meeting's coming up in Madison yep. in June. That's right. Um, and uh, it's there's an in-person component. I highly recommend the in-person component, but there's Absolutely. also a virtual component for people who want to want to attend the meeting virtually, right? That's right. Yeah, so we'll be in Madison this year. We're going to Anchorage next year. Really? Uh, yeah. That's been decided. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I know when that was floated, there was some pushback. So yeah. uh, no, we're going. I, so. I would say that I'm sorry I didn't get to participate in those board meetings where that was discussed, <laughs> but I'm really not sorry at all. Uh, I know. <laughs> I've taken on that role. Yeah. So. <laughs> so that's great. Okay, so Madison this year, Anchorage next year. I will be at the Madison meeting for mm -hmm. anybody who wants to come. Uh, I will almost certainly be at the Anchorage meeting because that, that will be very cool to get to go to Alaska. Right, and that's easy to get to from Seattle. Yeah, so. relatively easy from Seattle. Yep. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to say about age? Uh, no, yeah. I, I certainly encourage you to join. Uh, if you're in the, even if you're just someone interested in aging and, and, and a, a, someone you consider a lay, a lay person, we, we have members who are lay members and uh, we certainly would like more engagement with that. So it, it, please come. Yeah, it would be a good time. Awesome. Okay, so now lightning round. All, All right. right, I haven't done this yet. I did oh. it with Peter a, a long time ago. All right, but uh, so just tell me what. Don't think about it. Just tell me what comes to your mind. We can edit it out if you say anything right. you don't like. <laughs> yeah. All right, your favorite hallmark of aging. You have twelve to choose from now. It used to be nine. Now you have twelve. What's your favorite? You can look at the picture if you want to refresh your memory on what the hallmarks. Oh, of aging which are. one? This is I found. I put a happy picture of you for your favorite. Right. Oh, great. Yeah. I couldn't find I was an unhappy a, when picture. I was a little younger. So yeah. that's right. Um, I, I would say right off the top of my head, probably inflammation. I think uh, it's, yeah, that's uh, a good call. That's solid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Inflammation increases with age is involved in many, many, many diseases and, uh, and my pathway influences inflammation. Okay. Yeah. All right. What's your least favorite? So I couldn't find an angry picture of you. So I put an angry picture of me lifting weights. <laughs> uh, least favorite. Um, I, I don't know. I think I think they're they all have importance. Don't be too I, I, politically correct here. Uh, the 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 one that really jumps to mind is telomeres, and okay, the, the reason I say that is um, that's the easy call. That's it's what... easy call. It's it, the, the only <laughs> reason I say that is because if it's the first thing that everybody's always heard of related to aging. Yeah, um, and yeah, so, I can see that. Yeah, so okay. th there's certainly importance of telomeres in in aging and age associated disease, but uh, there's more to it than that. Somebody's got to come in last. All right. Uh, we kind of talked about this, low protein or low carb, where do you land? Um, sir, uh, low carb. Okay. That, yeah, that makes sense. Cardio or weights? We also kind of talked about this. Uh, both. Both. Okay. Good call. Ah, this is from a Jax guy. You got to be careful here. Yeah. Black six or UM het three. I couldn't find a UM het three mouse picture. So this is our friend, Rich. Right. Um, I, who I, advocates I, for UM het three and doesn't think that black six is actually a mouse. Oh, I see. Uh, I mean, I, I I would probably say UM Het three because you get the genetic diversity in the background. Um, That's a safe answer. Yeah, and I, but black six are are useful because the they are all the same. You can do faster experiments. You just have to validate them in a in a more genetically diverse. Here's an interesting question: Have you ever come across anything in the longevity space that worked really well in black six that didn't work in UM Het three? Didn't work in UM Het three. Um, 
you know, I, I don't have one off the top of my head. I mean, people I will point to Matt Foreman because yeah. that didn't come out of the ITP. But if you actually look at that DeCabo study, the effect was like 4%. Yeah, eh. I don't, I, I'm, and that was at one dose, and at the other dose, it shortened lifespan by ten percent. So, eh. right. <laughs> so I, I ask that because I sort of—I mean, I agree with you. I think UMHet three is superior from a genetic perspective. It's genetically diverse, but Black Six has worked really well, and I'm not really aware of anything where they didn't line up that yeah. where it was a big effect. Well, th there's an advantage to Black Six in, it, in that it's one of the longer-lived uh, right. inbred strains, and so you, you're not. You at least don't have the worry that if you were looking at a very short-lived strain that you're just looking at one form of cancer or some right. other specific disease that that mouse gets. Right. Absolutely true. Um, yeah. And that you're going to get some of that with any inbred strain, but at least you're at least starting with a longer-lived time. Yeah. Yeah. Point, so. And I know this is something that the Jack's Aging Group thinks about a lot, and they're yeah. working with some other genetically diverse backgrounds as well. Yeah. I, I think the answer is that we need to have more diverse tools. Yeah. Um, and Black Six has a lot of advantages. We have a lot of historic data on how they behave and what's right. what is likely to work and not work. And we have things like the knockout collection where we can just go and get the mouse off the shelf and look at those. Right. Which is not available in Pet 3. Right. right. So you'd have to make that. And it used to be you could all, Black Six was the only background where you could buy commercially available older animals. Jax has now started selling aged pet three mice i don't know how much those are being used I just, yeah I and know. as as someone from jacks you don't have up here the diversity outbred mice which is a another right. uh, diverse tool and uh it's a little bit different where these mice are randomly bred at every generation they start with eight uh inbred strains with the which includes several wild derived strains right. so the genetic diversity in the diversity outbred mice is even larger than the um het threes right. Right. And, uh, yeah, I guess we didn't talk about this here, but the UM Het 3s are made up of four right. strains bred together, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and those are all classically inbred strains that have been kind of adapted to the laboratory environment. Whereas right. the when they made the diversity outbred panel and the, the related uh, collaborative cross mice, they started with eight yeah, eight strains, five of which were classically inbred strains, lab adapted, but three were with these wild drive strains. Right. And, and those provide... I think 75% of the genetic diversity right. in that background. And this ties back to what we talked about earlier about how when you breed animals in the laboratory for many, many generations, you lose a subset of the That's genetic right. variation just by selecting yeah. them for laboratory conditions. And there are there are disadvantages to these uh, heterogeneous populations in that the their lifespan and all their other phenotypes are more highly variable. Right. That gives you strength when you want to do a genetic mapping study because you can more precisely map things. Um, but it's harder when you want to do an intervention study because the more variable your lifespan, right. the the more animals you need to see right. a change. Right. And so the statistics get harder. On the other hand, right. if your goal is to increase lifespan in people, then you probably want to understand that variation. That's right. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, you got to think about all these things when you're designing yeah. the experiments. But okay. I mean, it's good that we have all of these tools. Yeah. Okay. Now, worms or mice? This is going to be a tough call. Yeah. Um, uh, worms for speed. I, I, I'm a C. elegans guy. Yeah, all right, that's so fair. Is, so, hey, but, there's, there's no uh, wrong answer. Right. Well, maybe uh, there is. But. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, you, a lot of things that ha are going to work in a worm are not going to translate. And so you got to go through and look at the mouse. Um, so, you, again, you need both. You need the worm for the high throughput early studies and you need the mouse for the preclinical validations. All right. Uh, rapamycin or resveratrol? Uh, rapamycin. Um, ah, NAD or 3HA. If you had to take one. Which would you take and why? I mean, probably, you have to take one. Two bottles here. One. You have to take one of them. Which I one? I mean, and probably three HA given the data, but it's, okay. it's still fair. pretty early. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what I would pick. I, yeah. uh, I mean, NAD, you know, is going to be safe. That's, that's the, the, that's the, the trade off. Yeah. That's why I hesitate, right? right? So yeah. Yeah, and, uh, maybe in another two or three years, we can really nail that down. But. All right. All right. Uh, oh, here we go. University of Washington or University of Arizona? Dubs or, the, what is it, Wilbur? You don't have to answer that if it's going to get you in trouble. It, it will get me in trouble. I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I've got a I, U of A now. They, they gave me a faculty position. Okay. Uh, All right. Fair enough. I don't know. Dubs is pretty cute. Yeah. All right. right. I mean, Dubs uh, is very cute. Anything yeah. else that we have not talked about that you think is important? Uh, I don't know. Not off the top of my head. I think we've covered a lot of ground here today. So Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming down here. It's been fun. I'm thank sure that we me. have... Uh, said some things that we may regret regret but uh not too much right. <laughs> so i hope you had a good time i hope I you had did. a good time um 
As always, if you have any comments or questions, please leave them uh, in the comment section below. If you like this content, please subscribe, and I hope to see you next time on the Optus Band podcast.